Welcome back to an extended Orthodox Ethos podcast. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the Orthodox Catholic dialogue, the question of the Chieti and Alexandria documents, and in particular, can unity be attained by decontextualizing history? Joining me tonight is Craig Trulia from Orthodox Christian Theology. Good evening, Greg. Craig, how you doing? It's good to be here, Father Peter. Thank you for coming on with us and talking about some important developments in the uh, area of our dialogue with uh, Catholicism, and in particular, the uh, recent developments after Alexandria, and the whole question of the postmodernist epistemology or gnosiology, which is something that you've spent some time examining. Look forward to hearing about that. As everyone here, I'm sure, that's coming to listen to what we have to say, and everyone in the church, all of us desire <clears throat> and hope for uh, a development which will bring uh, all of us closer to a true unity in Christ, which of course would mean uh, a great deal of repentance. I mean, the repentance is the first word of our Lord when he began his mission, and, and it's the status quo of every Orthodox Christian. It's a continual present. And so how much more when we have a big division, a thousand-year-old division? So I would like you to, to open up with uh, and uh, give us uh, a little bit of context about the deep contextualization of history that you see uh, possibly going on uh, within the dialogue. Yeah, it's the important thing is we, of course, want union, and we want a good, strong union, and we're always repenting. And so I found grappling with this issue, there's the spiritual aspect where we apply what we were just talking about, the repentance to our lives. And then when we look at the historical and the current events, we sometimes almost compartmentalize it like it's something different or it's treated differently, but it shouldn't be. My my own sympathies are actually very ecumenist. And the reason I bring that up is because a big reason I became Orthodox because I was hoping um, that, well, I wanted to be part of the church, the church that was started by the apostles. And I wanted everyone also to be Orthodox. And I didn't understand why these divisions existed and why that wasn't possible. So my sympathies are like, we want to all be together. But the more I study the Orthodox faith, live uh, just the Orthodox life, attending services, doing prayers, I'm not talking about very high and mighty stuff, just normal things, normal lay people do. I started realizing that, well, there's more to it than this. And especially when we read the fathers. And so then to distill this, I've arrived at a conclusion that whether people are Orthodox or Roman Catholic, people studying the fathers and the councils and the things that really identify the differences between Roman Catholics and Orthodox, they are looking at these things in a very decontextualized way, which we're I'm gonna I want to unpack. They are looking at this with a more than a tinge of postmodernism mm -hmm. and relativism. And so we start looking at the truths and dogmas and doctrines of the faith as if there's some sort of abstractions not connected to everything else. And mm -hmm. that is not how the fathers approached it. And it's not how it could be understood. And because of that, I am going to make the case that union has to be predicated upon contextualizing the teaching of the fathers, contextualizing Orthodox dogmas mm -hmm. that a, a, a true union could not be attained through decontextualization because the issue is that's where the cultural zeitgeist is right now, especially among the academics, is that, well, if we could look past our differences or we could 
reevaluate our beliefs. We don't have to change the words, but reevaluate what those words mean. Then we could smooth over things. But that's at the expense of the context, which actually is what we use to derive meaning. So it's it's very profound. It, this is a this is really something that draw drew me into your uh, uh, this this talk tonight, and, and really propelled me to say let's get let's do this is because. Of course, the whole theology of the church is incarnational, <clears throat> and it's the scandal of uh, uh, the particular in the incarnation that is that is oftentimes the the uh, cross that we don't want to bear. We don't want to crucify our mind and and many today uh, with the idea that God became man in a particular time and space, and you have to find him in a particular time and space, and that is the body of Christ throughout the throughout the ages. And so the idea of context and seeing everything in the proper context seems to me to be extremely important uh, on many levels, but how much more in terms of this uh, thousand year rift and departure uh, of, of uh, uh, the papacy from orthodoxy. So uh, yeah, it, it's, I think it's a extremely important point that's not being made. And so I'm very happy that one of the reasons why I said let's get together is because I think this is uh, something that's not being talked about enough. Yeah, th this is something that's going to come across very academic, so we're going to have to define terms and stuff as we go. I think there is a sort of prejudice that those that appear to represent traditional orthodoxy, that they're mindless or fetistic, but what we're going to actually see, it's the opposite, that the, the fathers weren't silly people. They were the rocket scientists of their day, but they were theologians. And so the fathers weren't mindless. Their, their way of approaching the faith and understanding um, the sacred tradition is highly contextual. And that's why it actually stands up to intellectual scrutiny more than what we're going to see the postmodernist approach, which has mm -hmm. taken over. So um, if you're ready, I'll I'll just start talking yeah. about how how this has affected the Roman Catholic zeitgeist <clears throat> and why I think the that will have an effect on any possible unionist talks, especially coming soon, for example, in Nicaea in a couple of years in 2025. And the implication seems to be that we Orthodox are also partaking of that, that pestilence of the age, that postmodernist uh, epistemology to a certain degree. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having to talk about this. Absolutely, because what, what, when we unpack this, we're going to start seeing that, oh, wait, I share that assumption with maybe these Roman Catholic academics, and that's an issue. We won't have the time to unpack where it all started, because I've done studies in that too. Um, we're more going to be talking about current events, because I think unless your hands in this, head's in the sand, if anyone who's following Roman Catholic scholarship they would realize they regularly decontextualize. And it's not that we just care about what scholars think because the, the truth of the matter is that all the bishops with their salt all have PhDs, right? They they are all academics in their own right. They all read um, academic texts, or at least they follow and hope to stay abreast of these things. And so when Roman Catholic scholars on a regular basis decontextualize um, history, my opinion is, they unintentionally, it's not their intent, of course, but unintentionally trivialize their own doctrines. Now, here's a few famous examples. Yeah, I was now, gonna say, let's let's define it and then tell us some examples. Can you give us just for the total novice here, what does the term even mean, decontextualization? Well, decontextualize would be to establish um, truth irrespective of how people came to it, right? So like, I don't know, in um, history, it would be like reading the Constitution and instead of interpreting the first uh, 10 amendments according to what the people who wrote them thought they meant, we would take maybe a living Constitution doctrine because um, there's jur uh, juridical doctrines, by the way, when it comes to uh, constitutional law and be like, well, the meaning of the amendment could evolve over time. Mm -hmm. That decontextualizes what the words meant when they wrote them. Right. Mm. So people naturally and this is how, you know, this is what's good. Human nature is is good. And so people by nature think of truth in a highly contextual way without being academics. Right. They they believe what their husband or wife tells them because all the dots connect. Right. They don't just listen to words totally disconnected from 
everything else within their lives. And so the same way we read documents as connected to the people who wrote them, when they write words, the, the words have intentions behind their meaning, um, which the authors in the historical context would determine. So it's, it's really not complicated. It's just if you don't just take someone at the word, but you look at their facial expressions, you look at their actions, you look at the people they know, then you're looking at context as well in doing these things. And it's quite frankly, it's very bizarre because almost no one decontextualizes anything in real life. It seems like only abstractions and uh, intellectual ideas, people even dare decontextualize. Is it possible oh, that to be fair, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Though to be fair, when we're reaching the point where people aren't sure what their gender is, there has we are reaching the point as a society where we're actually divorcing context um, of our opinions from like things like basic genetics and let alone, mm. um, you know, like little boys and girls, you know, body parts and stuff like that. I don't want to get into that topic, right, but right, this is right. part is of the zeitgeist. It, is it possible that uh, the the reason why we're even we're, that this is happening in the context of theology and church history and church life is because we don't have those who are engaged in it don't have the same experience. In other words, presupposed in understanding what the saints said is a similar or the same experience of the saints. So some something similar, like you cannot write a life of a saint if you are not like that saint. You're going to end up, or the scriptures presuppose the context of the church in order to be properly understood. Is yes. that is it possible that we're arriving at now at a total uh, decontextualization of church history for not only because there's some kind of special interests and and agendas, but because we lack and we don't even come. If we came with the same or similar experience, wouldn't that be much harder? I mean, what was me, how far my spiritual life is from the ascetic <clears throat> disciplines of the saints, but to just begin understanding these topics, we need to have our prayers. We need to have our Wednesday, Friday fast. We need to be following the liturgical calendar of the church. How do you otherwise begin understanding these things? I mean, not to derail the topic, but um, a lot of people in trying to discern the history of icons, it seems to be very apparent that a lot of scholars, for example, studying the art have never in, been informed by the use of the same art in worship. And so how could they even possibly interpret what they are being paid as experts to interpret and study, right? right. So we, we need to be hooked up to the church, to put it very basically, in order to really begin understanding Great. these things. Let's hear, let's hear some examples. You were going to say some examples. Uh, the, so now, this is stuff which, if it wasn't true, would sound like extremely bizarre. Now, this is mainstream, I would say, like, majority stuff in Roman Catholic circles. Now, for a popular example is Eamon Duffy is comfortable with there being no original papacy. You go, wait a second, there's all these arguments that, you know, the Pope of Rome, he's necessary, he's not necessary, but yet... Those serving on the pontifical commission, you know, for these matters, don't even think there originally was a papacy. So how does that work? Um, Father Christian Copps, who's a head of a seminary in Pittsburgh, so he's he's not a nobody. Um, he asserts that the Council of Florence was subordinationist, heretical, in other words. Right? Yeah, they were teaching a, her a heresy. You know, so wait a second. So Orthodox didn't become Roman Catholic because they're teaching a a heresy, and they dogmatize something, intending it to be a heretical, but somehow the Orthodox are wrong. Sounds very bizarre, but this is mainstream scholarship. Um, a scholar I particularly like, um, Benjamin Heidgerken, he's a seminary professor. He asserts that the Council of Trent's intended soteriolo soteriology requires reform in light of the teachings of St. Maximus the Damascene. And he's not as explicit about this, but he appears to imply the same about the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. So it seems like for years, the Roman Catholic Church has made concessions, whether it's in the field of academia or in these joint commissions, on every important doctrine with the Orthodox. I mean, so today we're going to cover Chieti and Alexandria more specifically, where allegedly those same sort of uh, concessions are made. But I can see why there's this sort of allure that Orthodox think that the ecumenical movement's been very successful in bringing people to the Orthodox side because the Roman Catholics are making concessions to us 
um, we tend not to be making the same concessions to them, at least not as on the surface. And so what I really want to challenge people is to ask yourself the question, is this really the case? My, my thesis is that the ecumenical movement, for better or worse, is epistemically postmodernist. And as a result, any agreement made following that precise epistemology will prove out to be objectively meaningless. So if you want, Father, I could define terms. So people- yeah. it's, always good. it's always good to define terms. Yes, please. And so the ecumenical movement, lack of a better definition, is a movement intent upon establishing communion between the world's different Christian denominations via minimizing the differences that delineate various sects. Even and in extreme cases, sadly, this has not been a note, ecumenism even transcends Christianity itself, like things in common with Buddhism and and Islam and one. I'm not sure if you have anything you want to add to that, Father, because you know more about the ecumenical movement than I do. That's fine. That's fine. For our purposes, that's good. Okay. So there, there's a good definition. Now let's just define epistemology because it sounds like a big word. Epistemology is essentially a theory of knowledge or in very plain English, how we know something, right? Like, so your epistemology is how you approach knowing stuff. So it, it's a complicated sound word, but it's not a complicated concept. Now, we were talking about this before now with postmodernism in reference to epistemology, how we know stuff, is the rejection that anything has objective meaning or that actual epistemic certainty is possible. Or in other words, there's no such thing as universal truth and truth cannot really be known for certain. All right. So in common parlance, postmodernism is actually very popular. It's the idea that truth is relative or everyone has their own truth or tomato, tomato, etc. So postmodernism is very much the zeitgeist of this age. Mm -hmm. And so none of the proceedings attended as a slur. It's, I find it ironic when people that espouse to be postmodernists, they say they're postmodernists. It's not an insult, but we call something postmodernist. It's an insult. I, all I can tell you is my intent is not to insult it. I just want to demonstrate how this is precisely what the church is confronting today. And I think this is a problem. So before we prove that out, I just want for a moment you know, the audience presume that what I'm saying is true. You know, what problems does a union on the basis of people having these like postmodernist, the truth is relative sort of assumptions have? Well, let's just suppose both sides, the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox, enter to union. And under the presumption, there's no objective truth. Well, if that's the case, then any certainty over the meaning of the agreement is unknown by both sides, right? Because they have no belief in objective truth. So how do you know what was really even agreed upon? So that seems to be a non-starter. But what if one side enters in union under the presumption of there being no objective truth, um, but the other side enters believing, yeah, no, things we could know to be true and they're non-negotiable. Well, in that point, you know, if that's the case, then one side means it and the other side doesn't mean it. And so how do you have an agreement when one side means it and one side doesn't? So that doesn't work. Now, if both sides enter to union, you're not maintaining, because people look at these things to the logical extent, which it never is, but maintaining a, a, a postmodernism that's not ideologically pure. It's just tinged with postmodernism. <clears throat> um, but they largely presume upon a relativist, a relativist form of truth that, oh, we're just speaking past each other, and they might have meant some different things back then, but we know better now, we can reinterpret it now. Well, what this creates is a great degree of uncertainty as to what is really meant, right? Because no one actually hashed out, this is what really this <laughs> means. This is what's really what's right or wrong. I mean, that never occurs in this sort of conversation. So that also renders the agreement effectively useless. So no matter which of the preceding options I just laid out is correct, how this uh, union may go about if it occurs, the result of such a union would be the side with more power at any given moment will dictate terms and meaning. Um, this is as old as Plato, but essentially, if no one knows what's true, the more powerful person is going to tell you what's true. That would seem to be very consistent with the whole nihilistic um, philosophy and understanding of, of the age, right, as well, because it's a, it's, it's a question of power, not a, not a question of truth. So well, in the end... Well, who has more power is going to come out no matter what's said, no matter what's conceded, that person's going to come out on top. Yeah. I mean, let's be grown ups. It's not an impartial process. You know, who determines what disinformation is? Um, impartial people, 
um, detached from the world or the people that own newspapers, TV stations, server farms, and websites, right? So obviously the people with financial, um, social, and political influence, um, they determine what people think is true. They don't determine the truth, but they determine what people think is true because the power. Um, this is as old as Thrasymachus in Plato's Republic. He said, justice is the will of the stronger. For all pragmatic purposes, this is right, even if we know in our gut that's not really what truth is. Just because I'm physically stronger than my wife doesn't mean I'm always right and she's always wrong. I mean, that's ridiculous, clearly. But if we reduce everything to being objectively meaningless, then just whoever's the most power is going to dictate what you ought to believe at any given moment. Um, power dynamics obviously will favor the Roman Catholic side if we approach the union um, in any sort of sense where the truth is relative or any sort of epistemic postmodernism. I don't want to get off on a tangent, but my in my mind is flashing some experiences I've had with representatives in that ecumenical movement, and then the the thinking that I encountered there, I would I like I reminded me of a as of a Jesuit. Uh, kind of approach to to truth, and that is that well, you can say one thing and mean it means something else uh, if it serves your purposes. Is this perhaps one of the historical roots of this contemporary uh, you know zeitgeist, or is that a, a forerunner? Or how would you understand? I that? I actually have not studied the history of the uh, the Jesuits and uh, their movement, um, but what I could tell you is. I'm going to unpack what these scholars say and what they clearly actually do. We're, we're going to cite it, but what they clearly actually even do is just redetermine what's true and redetermine meaning. Hmm. The only thing that is non negotiable to them, as we'll get into, is the actual verbiage of a dogmatic decree. But what that dogmatic decree means could be could change suiting their purposes. So hmm. it's uh kind of terrifying if you look at that because as someone who believes in like objective truth and orthodoxly actually orthodoxy actually maintains doctrines that are correct according to its namesake orthodoxy right the proceeding sounds bad to me right there i believe being that's the name of the church that there is a correct doctrine you know so because that is the case a true union, a true union is only possible if the side with objective falsehoods repents by admitting they were wrong all along and actually wants to change. They actually want to not have their old dogmatic decrees that were intended to be heretical. They want correct dogmatic decrees that were intended to be correct. Um, and I have to think people have to look at this in a, a pastoral sense. And, and Father, you you could obviously speak to this uh, more to this than me, but like long-term divisions between people are not repaired by obfuscating matters or ignoring them. But by repenting, you know, like uh, a cheating spouse has to stop cheating and recognizing they're wrong. You can't just be like, you know, honey, forgive me. You know, he has to actually do something. There has to be a synergy there. Um, an abusive friend, an abusive acquaintance, a boss, a spouse must stop exacting abuse and recognize they were wrong to abuse the person, right? Like there has to be a repentance. There has to be a change. Um, and so... This is really pastoral. If divisions between people um, are fixed with repentance, then how are we going to fix church-wide issues in some way completely alien to this? It doesn't make any sense to me. It seems to me that you either if you don't go down the road of repentance, which means a reorientation, right, a, a total reorientation toward Christ, then you will your only option is a relativism if you're going to talk about a union. But I, it, it, this reminds me uh, of, of something I heard the, uh, the late Pope uh, Benedict say uh, and write. I wish I had the quote in front of me, but it was basically, maybe you even do quote him, I don't know. But it was basically along the lines of there is no return. No one's talking about return. We don't have a ecumenism of a return. That's, a, that's, that's not viable. We're not going to entertain that. But we're going to talk about a rec a, basically a reconciliation or recognition of what exists and so um that's so they're saying right return you know the return of the prodigal to the father was repentance so return and repentance the greek word for somebody who becomes orthodox is he returns i mean it's it's a met metastrophe it so return repentance a synonymous if we reject the idea that someone has to return to someone else then of course repentance is no longer possible it's not on the table 
So yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, there's no, they, not, there's no reorientation and there's no union between a wife and a, and a husband if there's not a reorientation and there's no real uh, union then. So it's, I mean, this is basic common sense. It's the same reason unrepentant killers should not get paroled. Imagine go, yeah, I'm going to kill again. All right, we'll let you out. That makes no sense. We all know that makes no sense. So obviously repentance is part of repairing situations. And so this is a problem if it's doctrinal, which is why we're writing doctrinal statements that does require repentance. Well, let's get out of the theory and let's start getting to the details. How real of a problem this is, and it's very real, okay? Now, I'm going to get into uh, get into uh, detail about um, certain scholars that are are not ideologically pure postmodernists. They don't even probably identify as postmodernists. But the fact that they identify as faithful Roman Catholics indicates a degree of cognitive dissonance on this question. So in other words, they are not consciously postmodernists, but in applying their own thoughts, they prove themselves to be to some degree. So let's talk about Eamon Duffy, um, like in his article, was there a bishop of Rome in the first century, which he concludes no, right? Uh, that seems to me a pretty like, you know, basic thing of Roman Catholicism that you need a pope, but Duffy served on the Pontifical Historical Commission, and his answer is no, there was no original pope. And he represents what some claim is to be a consensus of historians on the question, uh, such as Alan Brandt, Father John Baer, uh, Robert Eno, um, et cetera. And what these scholars teach is to quote Duffy, uh, there was no pope, no bishop as such, and the church in Rome was slow to develop the office of the chief bishop and that cities initially did not have singular bishops. So, and in other words, like essentially they were like the Presbyterian, the church was originally Presbyterian is the argument. So that means the church of Rome, Roman Catholic church was originally Presbyterian according to Duffy. Now, obviously such conclusions eviscerate the legitimacy of all Episcopal forms of Christianity, unless we presume upon some form of epistemic relativism. Now, what do I mean by epistemic relativism? Well, it's that the truth can be one thing in some times and places and another thing in other times and places. Now, this sounds bizarre, but people really kind of think about this stuff. So like, as an example, being abusive to women and forcing them to wear burqas in 1988 Afghanistan's okay, right? In fact, we were sending money to the Taliban uh, to fight the Soviets and it was okay they were doing these things, but it's wrong in 2023 America. Now, obviously, those of us listening would say, no, uh, 2023 America is right, 1988 Afghanistan is wrong. But those with epistemic relativism would say, no, it depends on the time and the place, what's true, what's not, what's right, what's wrong. Now, I think that Newman's theory, Carnal John Henry Newman, of doctoral development is what allows uh, scholars like Duffy to pretty much jettison common sense, right? To pretty much say there's no papacy, but that's okay. Not surprisingly, Duffy coined John Henry Newman a hero of the church. So he seems very aware of this. It's not just me like alleging this is something going through Duffy's mind. Now, if we allow for doctoral development, something does not have to be objectively an existent doctrine at one point, but it can exist and be dogmatized later. So for example, and this is how crazy this is, Newman did not believe that relics or even the Theotokos were originally venerated. All right. But now, dogmatically, we must venerate her and we must venerate the relics. I mean, it didn't exist at all. And now this practice and, and doctrine develops. And now we can actually dogmatize and say people have to do something that didn't exist at all. And so one could see from the proceeding how one could concede to the Orthodox there's no su such thing originally as papal supremacy, right? Or infallibility. They could even concede to the Presbyterians there's no such thing as bishops, as we know them today but you have to hold to the papacy now because it developed. And so it's a kind of twisted way of thinking, which is, I guess, loaded language, but it's twisted like in common parlance, but it's not twisted to the academics. This is stuff they take seriously. This, In fact, you're the crazy person if you write against this. You're the contrarian if you write against this. Uh, so people should be aware of this. This is it part of the thought process. It doesn't occur to anyone uh, that this is just fundamentally inconsistent with the whole incarnational theology of the church. In other words, you know, the faith once delivered and that it's Christ in every age, not just in every local church, as they talk about in these documents, but in every age, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I mean, the, the, the image of the church is Christ. 
or is that not held? They, they believe the church is somehow, I think they did depart at Vatican II, if I'm not mistaken, from what, what St. Augustine said, which was the church is the continuation of the incarnation. So if, if you don't believe the church is the image of Christ, the continuation of the incarnation, I guess you can see a development because it's just a human a human organization. I mean, how do they seem so anti-incarnational, what you're, what you're saying? Well, I mean, like the scripture says, you know, is God a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind? And I think that's Numbers 23, 19. But the answer to that question, according to the postmodernist, is yes. <laughs> God could change his mind or or God God's mind could kind of, his opinion could develop and pretty much become a different opinion. And, you know, that sounds crazy and ridiculous. God warned us in very plain language, and this is not how we should be thinking. Um, but because there's, like I said, my my own sympathies are ecumenists. We want all to get along, so we start jettisoning the truth because of our desires, right? Because repentance is hard. No one actually wants to change anything, right? No one wants to owe up to anything. No one wants to hurt anyone's feelings, right? We're constantly avoiding trying to do those things. And the fact of the matter is that sometimes you have to, that there are certain non-negotiables, like, and here's a non-negotiable. Uh, you shouldn't subscribe to a ecumenical council with a triadology uh, that is heretical and subordinationist. But according to Father Christian Copps, um, that's exactly what occurred in the Council of Florence. And you could, you guys could read about this in his article, The Filioque Thomas de Aquino of Byzantinus and Pseudo Basil's Contra Eunomium. Right? His, his argument in this article is that John Montanero, the driving force behind the Filioque in the Council of Florence, Taught, sober, taught subordinationism, and it was the council's intent to dogmatize the filioque with this meaning. Mm. Cops is, as I referred to before, a head of a union seminary in Pittsburgh. He's got works in St. Mark of Ephesus and Gregory Palamas, as well as his uh, Easternized treatment of the Immaculate Conception, which figure very prominently ecumenist circles. All the ecumenists are reading and citing Christian cops. Now, how does someone then say I'm a faithful Roman Catholic and say, well, and my council, which is non-negotiable, was subordinationist? This is the argument he makes. I'm not going to say it's a good argument, but this is the thought process that he has. He argues that Thomas Aquinas, as opposed to Florence, did not teach a subordinationist filioque. So he concludes that means there's a correct filioque. It's just not what Florence intended to dogmatize. But Florence, despite its own intentions, could have their decree interpreted in the Thomistic sense, and that's what saves it. So as long as you interpret Florence not according to how they intended to be interpreted, but according to how they could be interpreted linguistically, divorced from the context in which Florence determines its meaning, then you could do it. That's his argument. And so... Um, he probably got encouraged by the way that people are talking about the Fourth Ecumenical Council. It seems seem, seems familiar to me what you're saying in some ways. Is it not? the way Which that we council? I, I didn't hear the you. Fourth there. Ecumenical. We're reinterpreting the Fourth Ecumenical and what, what was meant. Oh, was absolutely. Meant. Right. Like, you know, because the, the separate issue with the Oriental Orthodox. But right. Oh, Chalcedon is a big misunderstanding. Right. Everything's a big misunderstanding. And so... We can now have to do the hard work, they would say, to reinterpreting Chalcedon in a way everyone could get on board with. Yeah. When the answer is either Chalcedon's wrong, we have to repent of it, or they're wrong about Chalcedon and they have to repent of it. Um, and obviously we are Orthodox, so we think Chalcedon is correct. But yes, I, I think that's what opened the floodgates for this. Like, you know, because it's much easier, that's more popular with Chalcedon than but with Florence and all. Um, but I want to bring something to the audience's attention. In the last two examples of Duffy and Cops, there are two epistemic linchpins, all right, that makes their worldview work. And one is doctoral development, and the other is infallibly dogmatized decrees are true despite what context would determine they were supposed to mean. All right, so I'm going to repeat that again. Yeah, repeat that because that's a really important thing for people to understand. I'm, I'm going to repeat that again because what we're going to find is Orthodox in the modern day and age are doing this. And that's the real danger because Some. look where Some. this leads. <laughs> it's that 
doctoral development allows for this postmodernist uh, approach to these uh, church doctrines and the belief that all that matters, the only thing that's binding, the only thing that's non-negotiable, the only thing that our conscience must follow is the dogmatized decree, not anything that informs the context of that decree. Mm. All right. Mm. Now, I referenced earlier before Benjamin Heidgerken. He's a Roman Catholic seminary professor. He his work, his book, Salvation to Temptation, I believe is a must read even for Orthodox. It's a, it's a, uh, a it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Um, he concludes essentially the East is right and Thomas Aquinas is wrong on these issues of anthropology. You know, St. Maximus, St. John Damascus, they're right. Aquinas is wrong. And so in his doctrinal dissertation, it's not as much in the book. I think the sequel will have this. But it's in, in his dissertation, Christ and the Tempter, he actually covers, well, what do we make of the Council of Trent, which dogmatized, dogmatized teachings on concupiscence um, in light of these Thomistic um, opinions and a medieval scholastic opinions of anthropology. And essentially he argues that, I'm going to quote him, in an absolute sense, neither the theology of St. Maximus, or he calls him St. Thomas, right? St. Thomas Aquinas, we don't believe he's a saint, is binding on the Christian or specifically Catholic conscience. For this reason, I must turn to Trent's affirmations about the nature of concupiscence. That's in pages 495, 496 of his dissertation. Now, why did I bring this up? He flat out says, ultimately, we are not, you know, the only thing that's non negotiable is what Trent says. And so, the saints could err, but not the decrees of councils. This is his argument. Now, he admits that Maximus' understanding of temptation differs in significant ways from the medieval definitions of the fomus, peccati. Um, that's a tinder of sin. It's this idea that um, essentially it's quasi-inherited guilt, that, um, the, that humanity is intrinsically disoriented and guilty by default, while the orthodox doctrine is human nature is good and it's the tropos that's fall. And we we talked about this uh, in a the Immaculate Conception episode we did. Mm -hmm. Now, and the reasons why it's because the Western tradition of concupiscence doesn't have the blame, the concept of blameless and blameworthy passions. So they have no way of understanding exactly what how the tropos is operating and on what basis. So the Roman Catholic doctrine of concupiscence actually invalidates Hebrews 4.15 because they have to make it where Christ really wasn't tempted because that's the only way to make it work. Hmm. Now, Trent is a product of Western anthropology. Uh, Dr. Heiger can uh, pretty much admits as much, but because they don't in adverbatum words endorse Fomes Peccati, it can be reinterpreted, he argues, according to Maximus' teaching. Now he admits, because he's a good scholar and he's honest and he's a good person, he admits to argue that such a reading, to make it according to Maximus and not according to the Scholastics, is possible, does not make it probable that one should read concupiscence this way, nor does it provide any particular reason beyond the novelty for doing so. As I say, it's a page 498 of his dissertation. So it's a novelty because he's, he's aware that Damascene, Maximus, they were never part of the consciousness of Roman Catholicism of how anthropology works. So... He admits that Trent actually held to an opinion that is, um, to make it correct, would have to require importing an Eastern novelty into it, the Eastern anthropology. Um, so as we can see, it's very similar to cops. You know, what was dogmatically decreed is all that matters, not what they attended to decree in Trent. And while I'm happy that, let's say, um, Heidegger agrees with us in anthropology, unlike cops with the filioque, the postmodernist approach of the to theology is clearly there, right? There, there's just this is not me making it up. I just covered three important guys, three different important topics on two different councils and and then the papacy itself. So you can connect Duffy to Vatican I if you want to. And they're all approaching this in the same way. And I'm gonna make the argument in a second that this is trickled down to the popular consciousness of Roman Catholics. So I don't mm -hmm. know if there's anything you want to say, Father. I think that's absolutely right, and uh, it's uh, it, it 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 permeates and uh, the, uh, the the whole ecumenical movement, and I think that ultimately it's the the agenda is all powerful. So we must have union. 
it's like a trance or a, a, you know a chant that we must all get on board and so figure it out like i've heard this kind of thing happening where a certain hierarchy i'm not going to name names a certain synod will give an order to an academic in in let's say athens and they'll say please we need this outcome go back to the canons and reinterpret it in such a way that we have this outcome <laughs> so this is the kind of uh, you know people are consciously sinister in that context. I I, I don't know their I don't know how else you could be if you if you're, you're you're going into it saying it doesn't mean that, but make it to mean that. Figure out a way that we can interpret it so that it works for us in the the contemporary situation. So I think there's you know there's 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 a spectrum of ill will, but you see the that kind of thing that's uh, going on all over the place because there's a there's clearly an agenda that's pushing this. It's not it's not a groundswell of individuals uh, and a grace filled you know uh, movement of repentance as they would like us to believe. But there is there is a guiding hands that are pushing pushing us in, in this direction, and they could be you could say well they're very good willed. I mean that's a who knows. But it, it's a phenomenon we're observing, I think. I, observe I, I, I do think spiritually people to discern what's the energy behind this. You know, God that he should not change his mind, right? <laughs> or no, things could change, right? Like, is that consistent with God? What is the energy behind that? And I'll, I'll just leave that there. And now, it, fundamentally, it fundamentally goes against the whole idea that to be Orthodox, at least in the Orthodox context, is to follow the Holy Fathers. The minute you oh, say yeah. you're That's the worst the thing you Father, can do. You're submitting you're not, there's no innovation possible. There's no reinterpretation possible. If you stand back and say, look, actually, our fathers are partly responsible for the divisions. So we don't really, can't really trust them. We're gonna, we, we need to, or, or this idea that you, that I've seen in, again in academic theology is we are the fathers. So we need now to come in our day and, you know, make uh, history. And so therefore we're kind of judging the fathers not being, uh, submitting to them and following them. So it's a totally, it's a different stance. It's a different stance. And then if in that stance, you're going to arrive at these kinds of, of, uh, you know, postmodern modernist, uh, uh, solutions. We're, we're going to find out in a bit that the fathers are quite a bit, um, I think more attuned and intellectually respectable on, on these issues of epistemology than what modern academics do today. I think there's a brain drain. I think we're losing people to hedge funds and, uh, and rocket scientists back then, the truly brilliant people became bishops. <laughs> and uh, I think there's a brain drain. People go where the money is. But that aside, the stuff with academics is stuff that Roman Catholics are dealing with the real world. And so it is a real problem. And postmodernism is found in modern Roman Catholic theological discourse. Now, I want to say, because the people following this on, the, on these YouTube channels, they follow apologetics. And the most popular Roman Catholic apologists are climbing atop each other to employ postmodernism to defend their beliefs. No, this now, is going to be very good, very helpful. This is going to be very helpful. It's going to take it and put it right where we are. Most of us, we're not very familiar with all the ins and outs of the dialogue, but this is going to be real. And then we can go back to the dialogue and look at it again. Yeah, it's. I'm, I'm just aware, of, and I appreciate everyone's patience, the audience, that uh, Father Peter, a, a lot of people that are that are hierarchs, that are priests, that are clergy, that are academics, do follow you and watch your stuff, whether for good or bad motives, whole other question. <laughs> um, and so I just want to come here just, you know, breathing fire. I want to demonstrate, like, no, this is something I've studied, and this is something that um, if you're well studied, you'll understand that what I'm saying is true. Yes. And so that's why we had to take this first 50 minutes to take the time to do that. But we're going to try to bring it more to uh, where people are at at this juncture. Now, recently on the issue of Nicaea II, there's all these arguments over whether icons are apostolic or not. And what amazed me was that Roman Catholic apologists like Trent Horn, who's a very nice guy, and Jimmy Akin, they appeared to concede to the Protestant polemicist that Iconodulia was not a concrete apostolic Christian teaching, but a doctrinal development. And this not only was to me so embarrassing for their side, that then other Roman Catholic apologists we're climbing top each other to make better and more nuanced arguments about the development of uh, the doctrinal development of icons. And so 
The proceeding presumes similarly to Newman that something can at one period not exist at all and then later be dogmatized as necessary. But it, it, that flies in the face of the very decision of the ecumenical council, which which clearly well, says this has always been the faith, always been the practice of the church. How could they, are they ignorant of that? Or are they just- Well, it's because everyone knows better than the uh, conciliar fathers. And what and I'm going to show no the conciliar fathers actually had a, a a very profound epistemology that's not oh if you're spiritual Superman it's like even I think an atheist go wait no they make these guys make more sense um, and it also helps that there are saints among them <laughs> that's a not more than a little bit of help so I just want to state if all that matters is a dogmatic decree whether you know because these are Roman Catholic apologists from a papal ex cathedra statement or a ecumenical council then one can utterly decontextualize anything. Okay, I mean, consider the following. I'm going to give two examples from two very popular Roman Catholic apologists who don't consider themselves postmodernists, but you're going to see now they are postmodernists, at least they are postmodernist leaning or adjacent. Now, Michael Lofton, who's the apologist behind Reason and Theology, LLC, he argues that ecumenical councils can err on matters of doctrine. So this is what speaking to what you're just saying, Father Peter, that like, so they just don't believe the councils are right about this? Well, the answer is yes, they, they don't believe the councils are right. I'm going to now quote him. This is in his article, Understand the Magisterium. It's on ReasonTheology.com. Michael writes, reforming the work of Chalcedon, the Council of Constantinople II said this letter to Maris was heretical. So people know the letter of Maris, um, letter to Maris uh, taught Nestorianism. It tried to save face for Chalcedon, by saying that the council fathers must have read a different letter than the, than the letter to Maris. Clearly, there was some degree of reform between Chalcedon and Constantinople II on the letter of Maris. Either, this is again, I'm not saying this, this is Michael Lofton. Either Chalcedon judged it as orthodox, and this was overturned by Constantinople II, so meaning Chalcedon endorsed a heretical letter, or Chalcedon did not sufficiently express its judgment on the letter, and Constantinople too finished the job. Regardless of which theory one adopts, some element of reform has to be conceded. All right, so as we can see, Lofton leaves open one of two possibilities. One, an ecumenical council approved the doctoral content of a letter declared heretical by a subsequent ecumenical council, or two, Chalcedon was too obscure on the question. Perhaps some had historian sympathies and some participants did not, requiring further clarification. So as one could see, either of the proceedings put the attendant meaning of Chalcedon's decree on Christology in doubt, right? We The context surrounding Chalcedon, now it's like you got these crypto historians that are in the mix. If the fathers of Chalcedon were historians or had a strong historian contingent, so like they had to make the Nestorians happy and you know, throw them a bone here or there. Then the wrong. Oriental Orthodox are entirely justified in saying that the decree was heretical or worded as so as to permit for heretical interpretation. So ironically, it's the Oriental Orthodox objection that presumes upon the existence of that objective truth that words have meaning which are shaped by the attentions of those who author them. All right. I'm going to call that conciliar contextualism. I'm going to get more than that in a bit. You wanted to say something, Father. So No, 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 no. I'll keep going. I'll shut up. <laughs> no, no, no. So, That's it. Keep going. It's great. So yeah, so like so again, it's the Oriental objection is very sensible if if the letter uh to Maris really was approved by the council. It's like, well, if you have these Nestorian sympathies, then that kind of throws everything you've done into doubt, into uh yeah, into um question. And that's really not wrong. That's just a common sense way of going at things. So Lofton, on the one hand, is obviously schooled in the thought process, the information scholars. So it's not just the scholars. It's these guys with 50,000 subscribers making tons of money off people on YouTube um, in good standing within the Roman Catholic Church. And he is not troubled that an ecumenical council could have intended to teach or cater in part heresy, just like Father Christian Cops is not bothered that Subordinationism was intended by Florence, right? Not bothered at all, either of them. All that Lofton apparently holds is sure is the decree is true, right? Well, Chalcedon's decree is true, but had to be reformed in Constantinople II to make it correct, hmm. all right? So it, again, it's that's completely heterodox, 
But this is, according to postmodernism, a possible way of thinking. Of course, you would never work with your own family members and stuff in this way, as we established beforehand. But this is part of the zeitgeist. And so context ultimately has nothing to do with it. And Lofton is not alone. Now, consider Eric Yabara, who, hats off to him, is probably the most influential apologist on the question of the papacy, vis-a-vis -vis orthodoxy, who's alive today. So that means something, right? They were to write the history of this. Uh, Eric Yabara is part of it. God bless him. Now, for those consider, you know, concerned about his papacy book, I'm going to do a little plug. It's not being answered. Don't worry. By God's grace, my book, Rise and Fall of the Papacy, will be out in a few months. So don't worry about that. But it's going to be published by Uncommodin Press, I might add. All right, you just Father Father Peter, you just broke the news. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. It will be published soon, God willing. And and rise and fall of the papacy will um, solve the question of the papacy and its historical dumb for scholars, clergy, and lady alike. Now let's consider how Yabara addresses the perceived difficulty. Um, in my published work on the Theotokos, um, I don't think this is an issue, but I'm not going to get into those details about the dating of these things. But Yabara just is what he perceives the difficulty because he assumes that Theotokos' assumption probably wasn't documented until the 5th or 6th centuries because that is the, the majority scholar opinion, though there is a couple scholars that reject this, and, and I agree with that. Now, but what is Yabara's opinion? Because this pertains to popular postmodernism. He writes in his article in ericyourbauer.org, The Dogmatization of the Bodily Assumption of Mary and the Appeal to History. He writes this. However, the Catholic Church does not look at documentary texts in precisely that manner that documented evidence must exist, nor do they share what the Protestant assumes about their own paradigms of authority. What I mean here is this. Even if the first historical document detailing the celebration of Dormition slash the Assumption of the Virgin Mary was from the 11th century, it would not thereby entail that the Catholic Church has no basis for upholding the teaching of the Assumption as an apostolic teaching that is binding for all Christians. So as one can see, your Barbara presumes that all that matters is that the dogma was decreed, which, by the way, happened in 1950, Right? So if no documented exists, evidence exists for a thousand years and it's not necessary, well, then why not 1900 years? In fact, what future dogmas may still lack any documented evidence of their existence today, but will be dogmatized in centuries time? And you must hold to them by that logic. So how does that even work to, to think? And again, it's not to insult them. It's the, it's the epistemology in such an absurd sense. Your borrower decontextualizes dogmas from archaeological, liturgical, and written precedent that documents their existence from, a, from antiquity among all Christians. So what stands alone as important in his worldview is affected by more than a tinge of postmodernism, and that's the dogmatic decree. That's all that matters. Once it's been dogmatized, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter. There's no uh, documented evidence of, the, of its existence. And so the proceeding demonstrates that the epistemology undergirding the scholarship, which appears to bring concessions to the Orthodox, right? Because I was saying before, well, Orthodox saying, well, this ecumenism looks to be working for us, is the same epistemology which undergirds Roman Catholic polemicists who seek to convert Orthodox members to their faith. It's the same epistemology. Mm. So postmodernism proves to be a double-edged sword. Can you uh, you a little, little more on that, a little unpack that a little bit? It's very, I think it's a huge point. And so it's been coined that the ideology of modern Roman Catholic apologetics, because most aren't going to just go, you know, and say, oh, I'm totally on board with everything Pope Francis does, and I'm totally on board with what the German bishops are doing, it, and the liberalism within the Roman Catholic Church. Most faithful Catholics... And that means most of the apologists, because why would he be defending a faith that you really didn't believe was correct, right? <laughs> um, are traditionalists, but what they find themselves doing is defending traditional ideas using postmodernist epistemology. And so they really shouldn't be called trads. All the trads are actually post trads, they're postmodernists defending traditional Roman Catholic mm -hmm. ideas. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I think in some respect they shouldn't be blamed because the defects in the Roman Catholic epistemology could actually be identified to the ninth century. They were invented by um, a papal librarian named Anastasius, and he wrote most of the foreign correspondence for three popes that during the Photian Schism. He's a mm -hmm. 
a, a figure of immense macro historical importance. I'm not going to get into a lot of details now, but if people want the origin of where this postmodernist view comes from, it's actually 12 centuries in the making. It didn't, it didn't happen in the last 50 years. That would make sense, though, because if if much of what the the doctrine doctrinal development of the West uh, is is going to be based in 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 an approach that's that's you know predates or dates from the schism, it's going to be consistent methodology, not going to be something that just came along at the end. To give Anastasius credit, at least he invented and forged his historical evidence to give it a basis in reality instead of outright reinter reinterpreting things that so you know that on the face of it disagree with him. Mm. That's uh, that's that's very good work. Uh, very good work. Very good. Let's and go so let's get into how what we just learned is going to pose potential problems in a couple years' time in Nicaea or whatever follow-up commission or council after that. Mm -hmm. What are we to do if Roman Catholic bishops and scholars show up in Nicaea? Because this is the modern day. They're not going to come alone. They're going to come with like First laymen. All, we, have, we have to tell people what's happening in Nicaea in 2025. There's going to be. Uh, yeah, get into that, Father. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. there is going to be a meeting. Uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople has already stated as much. The Pope has also confirmed that he's going to be there. And I know they're working on it within the Patriarchate. They're developing documents and they're going to very likely uh, have some kind of compromise on the Pascalian. And, and the Pope is going to join, I'm assuming, a lot of Orthodox, certainly not all the Orthodox, but a lot of the Orthodox in Nicaea in 25 for the 17, 1,700 year anniversary of the Council of Nicaea. And it's very, very much expected there's going to be major compromises made, perhaps more. It's hard to say right now, we don't have any like hard fast evidence, but there's a lot of speculation. There's going to be a, a compromise on the Pascalian and maybe much more. We'll see. Uh, God, you know, in due time. So that's that's what you're alluding to here. Yes. And what are we going to do when they show up and they have this postmodernist epistemology? Hmm. I suspect what a lot of Orthodox are going to have is a wait and see approach. Like, let's see if they bring the metaphorical olive branch or not. And this is not good enough, in my opinion, because people can bring an olive branch and say this was a big misunderstanding. We never believed um, um, the same thing. We have to look past our differences, right? You know, the differences on papalism and on uh, synodical ecclesiology. That's that's as old as the second century of Pope Victor. There's, we've been looking past each other the whole time. Maybe we just got to look past each other again. However, what prevents not only what what happens not only to the principle of the Orthodox Church demanding Orthodox, I mean, that's what we're named after, but time inertia, right, from creating a doctrinal drift as the Orthodox would be outnumbered by those uh, with unaltered and heterodox beliefs, right? If we go with, which just look past each other, this can't work because what's going to happen is it's going to be a current that's going to take us with it. And that, that's unacceptable. Let me ask, let me ask uh, from my personal experience at the University of Thessaloniki, I was sitting down with a very well-known um, theologian who was involved in the in dialogue with Catholicism. He was on the commission at the time. And we were discussing the filioque. And he was saying, well, you know, he was saying, look, they don't understand that they don't understand the whole question of economy. They're still, it's still, but, 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 and there was a lot of buts. And he said, I said, you know, I don't understand this because it seems like we're moving ahead at a really fast pace. What you're telling me from other things you've said to me, moving ahead toward a union, but we don't have a lot of things figured out. And I gave him an example, which he probably never thought of. And that is that we have a, a very robust and blessed development within Catholicism of Pentecostal uh, charismatic spirituality and, and all of that, what's implied there in terms of our understanding of the Holy Spirit, the working of the Holy Spirit. And clearly there's a lot of heretical ideas that are floating around. And his, his response was, we'll figure that out after the union. Right. We'll read the bill after it's passed. Yeah, right. So I said, well, that's simply not going to work for the vast majority of people who are going to be living in places like America, where we're a tiny minority and the vast majority of the Roman Catholics have no problem with saying that you can be a charismatic Pentecostal Orthodox, you know, papal Christian. And then that's going to seep into, Catholic, into Orthodoxy if that's legitimate. I mean, it, we're going to be swallowed up. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't bat an eye. So what you're talking about is real, and it's not just real on the part of the of Catholicism. It's 
I'm part of the Cubanists in the Orthodox Church. They do not care or they don't understand how just how how what a chasm exists and how many problems are not being dealt with. Maybe they don't care. I don't know. And, and consider the spirit be, behind Pentecostalism, where it not only transcends denominations, it transcends Christianity. There's Pentecostalist Islam in Africa. So it's I I don't know. It's I think St. Irenaeus is very clear that it's demonic, but that's a whole other question. But it's an example of what you're talking about, I think. Let's, yes. do, let's, deal, it, with it. Yeah. let's deal with it afterwards. We'll, we'll figure it out afterwards. You know, but I actually, that seems to be where, like, I here's where my suspicions are, but being someone who knows absolutely no one in the know, <laughs> that's all they are, suspicions. What if the Roman Catholic delegation comes and admits that the Orthodox are correct? They're not saying, let's look past each other. Let's not worry about this. They say, no, you're right about everything. And we will reinterpret all our past decrees according to the Orthodox mode. Council of Trent, Council of Florence, we're going to reinterpret all of them. So you tell, and to be exactly what you tell us what they should be. I think a lot of people in their YouTube channels would be jumping up and down as they made a union commence, right? It's they're going to agree with us. Because this sounds more like a, sounds like more than a generous compromise. You're never going to be offered this much, and that's why I fear that this will be the tactic that'll be used because it's the most likely to work. Um, saying, "Yeah, we'll agree with everything with you." Now, my suspicions aside, when we review the Chiatine Alexandria documents, this is, uh, and the same approach, by the way, is seen in the agreed statement on the Filioque, which I won't be covering. Both approaches, the look past each other approach, but also we'll reinterpret our Roman Catholic stuff to make it Orthodox. Both are followed. So most likely it'll be somewhere in the middle of those two ideas. Now, if the reinterpret everything approach is followed, what, pre what prevents the union from being reinterpreted and our own decrees from being decontextualized and mutated to be Roman Catholic or even something else over time, right? If they could do it, the same could happen to us because we're buying into it that it's possible. Right, if people could decontextualize their beliefs, then we will end up decontextualizing orthodoxy. And as you kind of referred to before, Father, that's already sort of occurring in the agreed statements of the Oriental Orthodox. It seems to be that we could de uh, we decontextualize in order to try to get on the same uh, the same page with them. Hmm. Now, I think, I think that would be a very uh, politically speaking, from a lot of the Roman Catholic world, that that would be rather painless. Because that's not, they're not even familiar with a lot of that uh, in terms of the Orthodox understanding of those things, right? So, as long as Trent's still there and it's the, the papers, the document is still there and we're still ascribing to it, you know, most people are not going to really have a problem if there's a new interpretation. Oh, no. Yeah, exactly. They could carry on um, as they're carrying before. Now, I think for us to maintain our intellectual and spiritual integrity, we must. Um, maintain the importance of context in informing our understanding of meaning. I'm repeating this again and again and again. Orthodox must maintain that their councils are correct and consistent with themselves and the patristic consensus, or in other words, sacred tradition. Hmm. Demanding we maintain the importance of context is a, is a simple but elegant solution, right? Decrees are not all that matters. Their intended meaning and consistency with the faith once and all delivered to the saints, as Jude 1.3 states, does matter. Hence, we cannot reinterpret a tradition or allow for a half-hearted acceptance. There needs to be repentance, not specifically of any given crime. You know, I'm sure no one there is going to be like mean people, but of multiple false doctrines and a false postmodernist epistemology. Roman Catholic, it's, you need an orthodox ethos, right? <laughs> you need an orthodox <laughs> ethos to be orthodox. That's the point, right? So you need to channel it. The Roman Catholics must be comfortable with forfeiting their post-schism traditions and their post-schism ethos. And unless this occurs, the orthodox by default will be counterfeiting their own. Mm, very good. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, the, the, this points to the dogma and ethos. They're inseparable. And so if you go that route, you're going to you're going to be abandoning uh, eventually their own dogmas. I, I can't agree more. Very well, because you named the channel that, of course. Yeah. <laughs> now, why is context important? Now, sacred tradition presumes upon its own cogency. Right, like the scriptures don't present themselves that they're esoteric and you can't possibly understand what they say. The the saints don't speak themselves that they're they're speaking in an enigma. 
um, they presume that the consensus of the saints is both real and tangible, and it's documented fact. When St. Vincent de Lorenz talks about what is tradition um, and the right interpretation of scripture, he presumes that you could actually delineate it and see it you know, throughout history and see it geographically everywhere. Now, the scriptures testify that sacred tradition existed wholly from the teaching of the apostles. So if being that it's it existed in its full form from the apostles, it's not like it's taking time to grow into its fullness. It already was full. Any doctrinal developments that occur are linguistic clarifications, as Dimitri Staniloy, the confessor, argues, not new ideas. So again, I'm going to repeat this. They're linguistic clarifications, right? We could say things about the Holy Trinity that sound clearer, but the doctrine of the Holy Trinity is not new. It wasn't new in the fourth century. It wasn't new in the second century. All right. It was from the apostles. So the there are linguistic clarifications, but not new ideas. So that means Numenian doctrinal development is impossible for us. We can't have no icons in existence and then have them exist and then be dogma and under anathema, you know, uh, if you don't venerate them. That that doesn't work in the orthodox mindset. So the ecumenical councils, when issuing their decrees, often speak, if anyone's read a council, as they are defining what has already been settled by consensus. Like an off-quoted thing they always say is, this is the teaching of the fathers. This is the orthodox faith, right? They're not saying we decree this as such and that settles it. They're, they're acclaiming, no, this is what the church has always taught. And in the ecumenical councils, there's always a, like, a, I forget what's called in law, but like exploration. Right, like they'll actually, all right, well, let's open the Bible and look at what the Bible says about this do, this uh, this doctrine. Now let's look at the fathers and look what the fathers say about this doctrine. The operating presumption is that the doctrine has been settled in the scriptures in church history, right? Not that they have magical powers to all of a sudden decree something that never existed before. That is not how the councils viewed themselves. So the idea that there are these differing scales of binding authorities and the council is the only mechanism to bind belief is a mindset completely missing from the councils because they felt the belief was already bound by sacred tradition. The belief, as far as they understood it, always existed. So all aberrations from what always existed are heresy. That's how the councils operated. Hmm. So this is why the criticism that the orthodox mindset is, to quote Father Richard Price, conciliar fundamentalism is a kind of slur, right? Hmm. Why does, because right, he's like, I, you know, because he's a Roman Catholic scholar, he translated all the ecumenical councils. And so he starts finding this bizarre non-Roman Catholic ideology in the ecumenical councils, which he calls conciliar fundamentalism, because the contextualist view is foreign from Roman Catholic epistemology. That's why he doesn't know what else to call it. It seems like fundamentalism, like a bunch of Baptists. But consider this, why does the Council of Constantinople I in 1351, the Palamite Council, anathematize those who refuse to accept the acts of the council, but only accept the decree? I'm going to repeat that. They anathematize those who accept only decrees, but not the acts along with them. And you can read this in paragraph 12 of the council's tomos. All right, so this is what the decree in Constantinople 1351. Why? Because in 1351, they presume the obvious that saints and councils were consistent and that a decree of a council is consistent with the contents, context that created it and the acts are the preservation of that context. So the saints and conciliar fathers are illumined so that by grace, what they teach is true, right? That's why in the icons, when we venerate um, the, the conciliar fathers of this or that ecumenical council, they have halos around because we understand that God was superintending their work, that the Holy Spirit was at work in the council. And so if this is true, how could they be entertaining Nestorianism, subordinationism, or some other damnable heresy? Why on earth would their decrees be trustworthy if the saints they, if the saints they quote, the substance of what they quoted, and their own work was not doctrinally trustworthy? I'm going to repeat that. Mm -hmm. Why would the decree of the council be trustworthy if the way they arrived at doctrinal conclusions was full of errors and not trustworthy, it makes no sense. All right, it, it makes absolutely no sense. It's a, um, it's an it's an inner division between the way and the truth. You can't you can't they can't be divided, right? You're saying it doesn't matter how you come to it, but that's the way. That's the that's the the methodology is a, is is inseparable from the outcome. Yeah. 
right? They're the looking into the scriptures, the looking into saints of the past, and then they're through a consensus saying this is what the teaching of the fathers is, right? It's a process informed by grace. That's the point. And it's a context that's actually delineated in the Acts because you get to see what they're talking about and, and how they're deriving to, these conclusions. You've got to accept that time and space, that's the incarnation, right? That that place and time and those people matter. What they meant mattered. You can't you can't abrogate that. You can't tweak that. You can't overlook that. It's all a part of the whole picture, and it's it's a part of the image of Christ in that time and space. Absolutely. Now, just to clear some confusion that may arise, um, people think, oh, well, then if the acts are as important as the decree of a council because we need the context to understand the decree, does that make like every jot and tittle of the acts um, absolute truth? And, you know, are they prophetic or this or that? And again, we need to return to how the councils to explain themselves in order to understand how they're going about this so we could kind of acquire this orthodox ethos. The Concilia Fathers, for example, of Constantinople II, they recognized, to quote them, one or two participants in Chalcedon may have improved something the historian. Like, you know, it's possible there could have been one or two people there outside the consensus with the wrong idea. But to quote, again, to quote uh, Constantinople II, everyone else did not. And you could read this in... Price, Constable 2, Volume 2, page 70, all right? It's, se it's Session 6, uh, Section 30, Paragraph 30. Now, the contextualist claim, all right, is not that every utterance in a council is perfect and that every single individual in a council had correct intentions, but that the overall mindset of everyone involved was orthodox and trustworthy. And this sensibly makes a given ecumenical council a good source for dogmatic pronouncements. It is the same reason we allegedly trust a peer review process, right? There's numerous experts who have established trust and authority in judging other experts in a peer review process. So a single bad peer reviewer in a rigorous peer review, being that many such reviewers should be looking to work, but anyone who's an academic knows it's really like only two people looking, so let's be honest. But in, in a rigorous peer review process, tons of experts are combing over things and making sure it's correct. Um, one bad reviewer would not render the whole peer review process moot, all right? It, would, it wouldn't counterfeit the whole process. So in the same way, one or two people wouldn't counterfeit Chalcedon. It would be everyone else that's important. Now, let's further consider, if we're talking about peer review, the peer, like, as an example, a peer-reviewed science journal, right? They're publishing an article about the moon. But let's say in this article about the moon, it presumes upon a geocentric universe. For the sake of this conversation, I'm not a scientist, but I presume we don't live in a geocentric universe. Now, would you trust what they say about the moon, even if the presumption of geocentrism is technically irrelevant from what they're studying? Like, let's say they're studying the nature of basalt on the moon's surface. Would you trust that study if they presumed upon geocentrism? Right? You wouldn't, because how do you trust Chalcedon if it approved of Nestorianism? How do you trust Constable II if it approved of monoenergism? How do you trust Florence if it approved of subordinationism? Right? We go, like, well, there's something wrong with these peer reviewers if they that they let this thing about geocentrism make its way through. In the same way, if any of these councils let a heresy go through, um, it would counterfeit the authority of the council. And so let me quote a pope against these Roman Catholics. Pope Galasius made the following defense to the Council of Chalcedon. He's not an Orthodox saint, but he's a saint for them. And he said about Chalcedon, for either it must be admitted in its entirety, or if it's partially redeemable, that means only partially right, it is no longer possible for it to stand firm in its entirety. All right? So he's saying the obvious, um, that you can't have the letter of Maris be heretical and then Chalcedon be okay. It all falls apart. So we can see that Galassius disagrees with Michael Lofton, but it's because Galassius wasn't tinged with postmodernism. That, that whole thought process didn't exist when he was alive. Um, and so Michael Lofton could be forgiven because that's the zeitgeist of the age he lives in. Conciliar contextualism appears to those who do not understand as ridiculous, right? Because like I said, it makes it seem like that the conciliar fathers are prophets of some sorts where every utterance they make on any question magically has authority, but I'm going to challenge the listener now. It is the postmodernists that ironically have, uh, and those are the adjacent my ideologies, by the way, because there's people that are traditionalists, but their whole view of orthodox authority is actually um, very postmodernist. It's like the only decree that counts. 
It is they that approach the conciliar fathers in a borderline magical sense, because consider the irrationality, right? I'm going to appeal to people's intellectual mindset, all right? Consider the irrationality of the idea that the only dogmatic decree, that only dogmatic decrees in faith and morals are binding, all right? Consider the irrationality that only dogmatic decrees of faith and morals are binding, infallible and dogmatic, and they could be completely divorced in that context. Consider the irrationality of that, because apparently, if that's possible, they must think that these conciliar fathers had no idea what they were talking about on a range of issues, right? They're subordinationists, they're Nestorianism, they're just total fools, they're total heretics. But magically, during the process of decreeing the main dogma in question, a trance or something must overcome them, ensuring that then and only then they will have no errors, right? And so what we start, what we actually see is the spirit behind this postmodernist uh, approach to conciliar decrees and papal ex cathedral statements is a conciliar Pentecostalism, right? Only when they give the decree, irrespective of the context, irrespective of their opinions and everything they're working on throughout the council, somehow magically what they say is correct. How is that not a sort of Montanism where a spirit overcomes them and what they say then is just magically correct? And so I don't see how that is very intellectually rigorous. In fact, the conciliar contextualist view, yes, the fathers are saintly and venerated, but they're, they're still men, right? They're not doing anything magical. Their, their trustworthiness on one question stems from their overall trustworthiness on theological questions as a whole. This is why quoting the saints means something, right? We quote St. Pius XII on one opinion. We presume his other opinions are also trustworthy because he's a saint. So generally... Their holiness dictates that they are trustworthy in all matters. The council, recognized perhaps not for the holiness of each individual member, because not everyone there is a canonized kind of, kind of saint, but the, the holiness of the common understanding is approached in the exact same way. All right? So unless you want to interrupt, I'm going to give a real like nuts and bolts example that's super obvious. This is why the Council of Nicaea II argued in favor of Iconodulia, Right? against the iconoclast who accepted the first six councils. And they told them, well, how could icons be wrong if the previous ecumenical councils who churches are still standing, right? Because they're only writing like 90 years after Con uh, Constantinople III. It's not like the church wasn't standing anymore. Well, these, council, these councils occurred in churches that have icons. So if iconodulia is a heresy, as the iconoclasts assert, then what does that mean for all of the other ecumenical councils, which taught that, which taught what they did with icons in their presence, right? Were the Orthodox in the eighth century approving of necessary Christological doctrines decreed in the past by idolaters? Obviously not. So obviously the contextualist view makes sense. It's like it's the source matters, and because that source matters, things that are ancillary to the main thing at issue, like the sixth council or the fifth council, icons weren't the main point of issue. In fact, they didn't come up at all in the fifth council, but they had icons there. So even though that's not the main topic at issue, it informs secondarily, it informs orthodox understanding because otherwise it throws everything else into disrepute. Mm -hmm. And that's not just a, a cope way of looking at it. That's just called keeping things in context. Um, and so that's why throw, I think, just, I'm sorry, Father. Throw, throw one, one thing in here. I mean. What occurs to me as I'm hearing you talk is that essentially we have a loss of an experience of of the pillar and ground of truth. You can't what the position that you're presenting as apparently being adopted by a number of contemporary apologists and ecumenists. It just strikes me as 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 a confession of faith of a confession of a lack of an experience of the, the, of holiness and and the power and the authority that that brings because as Father John Romanini says about the ecumenical councils, what made them ultimately have the great authority? I mean, one of the pillars or, or cornerstones is the experience of the saints that were at the council, right? The experience of Saint Nicholas or Saint Athanasius or their their decisive contribution was because they had reached. A likeness, you know, they went from the image to the likeness. So it presupposes an experience of the grace of God. So if you stand now and you call into question uh, th that these figures, the and the and the and the life that they led, which you would have to do if you were to doubt, if you were to embrace iconoclasm, for instance, you would have to call into question all of that. 
that it just it's a confession we don't have the experience of those men we were not in this in the tradition my is that too is that not follow or it seems to me to be implied i think it does follow it's just i think any one of us are just uncomfortable in in assessing our own spirituality and go you know yes but that's why these things for because i know a lot of people that are considering orthodoxy follow this channel they're they're not even catechumens yet or they're now catechumens they're not charismated and not baptized. Um, that's why they have to follow the spiritual disciplines. You can't read yourself into orthodoxy. You need to follow the spiritual disciplines because they inform understanding. That's why we do prostrations and prayer because they inform the heart, right? And that's why St. Gregory Palamas, he defended certain physical postures and approaches to prayer because he understood they inform the heart. Um, these things are psychosomatic. Um, and so it also informs you know, academic theology. Yes, you could have like say, uh, like uh, Father Dimitri Steneloy. You could have academics um, that are saints. You know, they they exist, uh, but he is also a confessor uh, of the faith, right? <laughs> so these academics, and it's, by the way, tons of Russian new martyrs are, are the same way. Um, they're informed also by experience. You can't just have, you know, you can't just think your way into this stuff. Okay. Keep going. I'm sorry the interruption, but I just felt like I wanted to say that because I think it was so obvious. It seems so obvious that we have a, a experiential, existential problem if we arrive at such a postmodernist uh, interpretation. Well, let me try to get to everyone in the Roman Catholics Orthodox same page uh, on this idea of contextualism. One of the best responses we could tell Protestants, for example, who reject ven the veneration of icons, right? Because they have their own peculiar interpretation of scripture. It's wrong but they interpret the scripture that icons are idols. You know, we could just tell them, so are you saying you got the scriptures from which you accuse us of being I idolaters from idolaters? Why would you follow the religious documents given to you by damnable idolaters, right? So if they just considered just the insanity <laughs> of their worldview of having this set of religious documents not even from people that you have a few differences of opinion with, but from people doing things that you think are harmful to salvation that will actually make you go to hell, then how is what they give you trustworthy? It's it's crazy. It's a crazy way of thinking. And is it's that because- one, Is that the reason why you have some some uh, Protestant apologists now trying to show that there were never icons in the first 340 years? Is that maybe behind, a little bit behind- uh... We've got to we've got to get out. We've got to change history and change who we who we receive the scriptures from because that makes us, uh, you know. I, I still don't see how that a value though of eleven hundred years after that of idolaters preserving documents which some German monk in fifteen hundred sees upon these documents given to him by idolaters, right? Like I, I just don't, I just don't see how that avails them uh, much. I think if they thought more carefully about these things. Um, they would see the obvious uh, spirit and rationality behind it. Um, but again, this, this is difficult because it does take fasting. It does take prayer. It does, does take doing good works um, to, in order to attract God's grace and to cooperate with God's grace in order to tra um, transform our minds like it speaks about it in Romans 12, I think it is. So this is something that is just not something people, oh, just give them the opinion and they'll just change their mind. It's, it has to be informed by spiritual practice and God's grace. Apart from the grace of God, we couldn't understand these things. Let's go on to the text, Alexandria and Chieti now. Yeah, so enough build up. Let's dive into Alexander and Chieti. Alexandria and Chieti. Now, now that we have appreciation for context, we can see why it's not good enough for Nicaea 2025 or any other future council to agree with us even 90% of the way or wax poetically with kind sounding words because a weed which I think a false body of teachings could be uh, properly compared to, grows back if only 90% of it's removed. A weed must be removed from the roots. So in our reading of the Alexandrianity documents, we will see that some good things are said. However, the documents adherence to the two linchpins of postmodernist dogmatic authority, that being one, doctrinal development, and two, the infallibility of only decrees, in effect renders them as contrary to the orthodox mindset and thereby damaging to a strong legitimate union. Now, I concur with Michael Lofton's analysis of these documents, particularly of Alexandria, and I'm going to quote him. He said, for better or worse, the Alexandria document changes nothing. At the end of the day, neither side denies its own ecclesiology. 
right? So I think that kind of summary that he gave is what we're going to see gets hashed out here as we go on. The Alexandria document focuses on the papacy after the schism. Chieti focuses more upon synodality vis-a-vis -vis primacy. Now, Chieti rightly identifies the church existed in the quote it, the organism of multiple local churches in communion. So it has this sort of rudimentary and apostolic approach to what the church was. But remember, this doctrine of uh, doctrine development is going to kind of forfeit these statements. Alexandria identifies that unity is found in, and it's quoting Chieti, the multiple gatherings of bishops and councils. But it recognizes only five patriarchal sees, and some people are aware there's several additional patriarchates in orthodoxy. There's, it's not just Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, Constantinople, Jerusalem that matter. There's other jurisdictions. They matter too. Now, that being said, um, I view that, um, let's see, I'm, I'm losing my spot. The multiple gang bishops. Oh, yes. So just so people are aware, this is the beginning of the Alexandria document. I'll just give citations. Um, if something's really important, we'll focus on it. But this is 0 0.1 to 0 0.3. Sorry, now, should I bring it up on the screen? Um, you could, yeah. And you could just scroll as we go. I'll give the citations. So we can already see that there's major problems because unity is not something that is decreed by bishops in isolation. It is not merely conciliar. It, it is conciliar, but it's not conciliar alone. As the letter of the patriarch states, it's the 18, it's the 1848 Pan Orthodox uh, Council. The people are likewise guardians of faith. That means, you know, me as a layman, other lay people, we're also guardians of faith. Our job is not to sit down and shut up. In fact, the hagiographic witness, like with Florence, the unionist, is to do something about it <laughs> if people go into union and heresy. Um, the laity and clergy must all be on board for something. All right. So I already see here the way this is being worded is in order just to get a bunch of academics and um, pretty much uh, desk bishops that are detached from the people on board, but not really make this a real union where we're really going to have brotherhood between um, laity and clergy. Now, Chianti broadly, to quote it, speaks of all the faithfuls playing a part in syn uh, synodality, but it leaves uh, it unsaid precisely how. Because again, there's just no concept they have because their views appeal to just dogmatic decrees and doctrinal development. Um, now, they also argue that primacy is a safeguard on unity with par, on par with synodality, but no father state says, find one state that says primacy is on par with, uh, with synodality or consensus. You, you find Pope saying it's consensus that matters. You know, there's no one arguing primacy is what matters. So does primacy exist? Of course it does. I mean, we got Canon 28 of Chalcedon, for example. Um, and Chieti speaks of, um, for example, in, um, and that's not on screen, Chieti, uh, in, in, in section four, it speaks of primacy of bishop over clergy. But where it ultimately lands is primacy is the hierarchy of bishops, which of course Rome is at the head. So uh, in 15 and 16. So I kind of failed to see how I chat these, this like super positive document for the Orthodox because it's really just making the argument that the papal uh, ecclesiastical developments are legitimate and primacy is required and necessary and good. Um, now, in sacred tradition, primacy exists for non-binding appellate matters and for seating arrangements and other honorary functions, right? And so primacy is good, rightly understood. So... What is a non-binding appellate matter? So I'll just say very briefly, in the church, there's disputes. So bishops could appeal to other bishops or to the synod in order to fix doctrinal disputes and jurisdictional disputes. But let's just say there's a problem in a synod. A whole synod went to heresy, which happens a lot in church. Do you want to point out anything here at the Chetty, or is it, uh, is it passed now? This is Chetty. Did we lose him? Oh, we got a freeze. Oh, too bad. Hang on. It's like the deposition of Paul there, Samasana. We, we, and we, lost you, we lost you for about a minute there. So we, you got to go back about 30 seconds. Okay, so... Froze up. At least I, on my screen, you froze up. So just go back two, or set, two sentences. All right, so I'll just I'll go back. 
Um, primacy is not a safeguard on par with synodality. No father states this. Does primacy exist, of course? Again, frozen. Different orders, but ultimately where Chieti lands on 12 and 15 and 16 is that primacy belongs to the Pope. And he has primacy over the other bishops. Um, but what is primacy according to sacred tradition? Because there is a right understanding of primacy. Primacy is um, the having authority in non-binding appellate matters, non-binding, and for seating arrangements and other honorary functions. Now, no one cares about seating arrangements or honorary functions, so I'm not going to really dwell on this. But non-binding appellate matters are where, let's say, a priest or bishop is in an unfair situation and they appeal to their synod and the synod is wrong, the synod's gone to heresy, um, they can then appeal to another synod and that other synod could now enter that person into their personal communion. But what they can't do is say, we settled it for the whole church because that's impossible. The whole church has to come to the decision. There has to be a consensus. And so that's why it's non-binding. Just so people are aware, we have popes that will excommunicate people, but then during the ecumenical council, affirmed that those people are still bishops because they understood they didn't settle the issue. This happens with Nestorius and this happens with Dioscorus. So these are very high level examples in church history. In fact, they'll be covered uh, tomorrow night during my debut of my documentary, Errors of the Catholics, which will address this issue in some detail um, if you want more details. So I'm not gonna take more detail here on this, but this is why um, Someone who enters from their own local community cannot speak for the whole church. Like, for example, the patriarchs of Moscow and Constantinople, they're still patriarchs even though there's an excommunication because there are those more nuanced reasons. A local excommunication is not binding any more than a local recognition of someone excommunicated from another uh, jurisdiction like Philaret uh, Denisenko, like in Ukraine, the Kiev patriarchy. All right, and so the point is, that people can have local excommunications, they can locally bring people into their communion, but it's not something that's binding the church until the church has a consensus on the issue. They can only tentatively decide the question. So when Rome, having primacy, receives an appeal, um, they could take a, they could approve someone in their communion like on a, uh, uh, Athena Athanasius, but ultimately they couldn't solve the issue until consensus formed around it, all right? And uh, that doesn't mean Athanasius was wrong or the Church of uh, Rome was wrong. That's just how ecclesiology works. And sometimes resolutions um, don't occur in people's lifetime. Like St. Pope Martin was deposed for wrong reasons. Um, Rome replaced him while he was still alive against his explicit wishes. Um, and he pretty much died excommunicated from the church. Um, same thing with St. Maximus. They weren't wrong. So sometimes bad things happen. That certainly does occur. Um, but the ecclesiology doesn't get altered by these unfair situations. The ecclesiology is the ecclesiology. Now, let me give a little detail about what is binding with appeals. And as I was referring to, there has to be agreed with all of the synods, whether it be a pan-Orthodox synod or ecumenical council, um, and they are the safeguard, uh, but not something, you know, uh, just primacy of the Pope of Rome. And, we have a lot of recent examples and examples in history. So, for example, in 2005 in Constantinople, the Patriarch of Jerusalem was deposed. It was a pan-Orthodox council. And Sophia in 1998. It was the, not a pan-Orthodox. So it was an Andy Musa. Andy Musa meant it was only the Greeks, just so you know. I thought Pan other I thought other legates from other jurisdictions were. No, there. they were not not invited. Only the only the ones in the Mediterranean were invited. That was one of the things that was an objection to the whole thing. All right, so so just so I know, then was the Slavs that weren't there, but like Alexandria? Pretty sure, and as far as I remember, maybe I'm incorrect, but it, it was it was the the so-called Endimusa. Endimusa is the one that they had throughout the. They talk about it in these documents. That was mainly the Mediterranean, the Patriarchates in Cyprus. Okay, well that's let how me I remember put, it. That's how I remember it anyway. Well, being that you're in Greece, then I'll put my foot in my mouth and I'll just move on to other examples. Yeah, in 1998, because I know. I know this for a fact. Um, they excommunicated the schismatic Bulgarian church, and um, every jurisdiction was there in Sofia other than Georgia. All right. So, so there's an example in recent memory where this is what the church did. Um, Moscow 6066 deposed Nikon of Moscow. 
Um, they're sent to the patriarchs to this, but not to the council's canons. That's a whole issue in Russian history where, quite frankly, I don't think any of us are well read enough in it, so I'll just leave that there. In Jerusalem, 1443, they excommunicated all the Unionist clergy, including the patriarch Constantinople. So that's another example of, again, a, pan -ortho a binding excommunication of pan-Orthodox synod. In Constantinople 867, it deposed Pope Stephen of Rome, which again had everyone in acceptance other than, of course, Pope Stephen of Rome. Constantinople II deposed Pope Vigilius of Rome. That's ecumenical council. Chalcedon deposed Pope Dioscorus, ecumenical council. Ephesus deposed Nestorius of Constantinople, ecumenical council. Antioch 269 deposed Paul Semisada, the Patriarch of Antioch. Um, letter 43 from St. Augustine, speaks that ecumenical council could overturn a decision of Roman synod. So it's what we could see in all these things, right? This idea that Alexandra Chetty teach that um, primacy is on par with synodality, it's absolutely not. Synodality is the ultimate determiner of these things. It could depose popes of Rome. A pan-Orthodox consensus is the ultimate disciplinary authority. It makes binding decisions on these questions. And that's why uh, the little spat back and forth on this question of Constantinople 2005 if, in fact, not every jurisdiction was represented, then let's say – Let's see if we can get it back. I don't know. Well – He'll come back in a second. We'll get just be patient. I think it's just a technical glitch. Um, there we go. You're back. I'm back. Where did I leave off, Father? At my uh, uh, you were saying, well, look at 2005. It was, if it was not representative of all the Orthodox, then it wasn't uh, didn't have the authority that it would it should. Have yeah, been. then the deposition could be non canonical. And uh, again, uh, this is stuff where you'd have to actually be reading Greek newspapers and stuff to to know more about yeah, 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 English no language. Yeah. But um, so anyway, that being said, that's why Alexandria and the Chetty documents are misleading and appear on purpose to leave the door open for Roman primacy beyond the limited honorary and non-binding appellate powers, right? Because they want primacy on par of synodality when there's no question that synodality is above primacy of the Pope of Rome. Now, interestingly, Chieti actually recognizes this for all those saying what I'm saying is Cope. In section 19, it states that the Bishop of Rome did not exercise appellate canonical authority over the East. All right, so what I'm telling you guys is what the canons delineate. But this is where we got to put our postmodernist hats on and realize why this concession is being made. All right, one can see that this does not exclude Rome from still theoretically having authority outside of merely Eastern canons, according to the ecclesiology, because we have to pay careful attention to the use of the word canonical in Chiatti and Alexandria. Because in Orthodox parlance, canonical sounds like it settles the question. But in Roman Catholic parlance, canons are disciplinary and fungible. This makes them fallible and ultimately not binding. You hear this all the time. Disciplines are fallible. And so we hear a concession, and what Roman Catholics are making is no concession at all. They're just saying, yup, that's what you think about it. But that's, that's not binding to them. So it admits what I said was right, but their difference in worldview actually leaves the door open for it being wrong. As, as crazy as it is, canonically I'm correct, but the canons could be an error if they're disciplinary, you see? So this is what you have to realize is part of their um, their ethos. Because you could we could walk into Nicaea 2025 and they'll say, we're going to affirm all the Orthodox canons. And that can mean actually absolutely nothing. Not without repentance, not without a change of ethos. Now, Chieti rightly identifies that Apostolic Canon 34 offers... They even say it, canonical model of primacy, and they see that in section 13. Um, just so people are aware, the bishop with primacy needs the consent of those lower on the hierarchy, right? He just can't act rogue, unlike Vatican I, which their decree says he doesn't require the consent of the bishops. And so, well, how does Chieti square this? I think the real issue is, yes, they say it's the canonical model of primacy, but it's not the exclusive model in which the church ought to follow. Hence, Apostolic Canon 34 indeed is canonical, 
But again, cannons are are fallible, so it's it's not the um, binding issue that that binding um, thing that addresses and solves the question. The decree of Vatican I, in their view, because it's a decree and not a canon, is infallible. So through this use of weasel words, we see Chietti, in fact, concedes nothing, right? It just tells us what we want to hear, but implies what they actually hold this issue on decrees, which we'll unpack more of. Um, now, Chietti identifies Roman prim primacy quite transparently, particularly from the 4th century onwards. Now, I actually argue their view of primacy is from the ninth century onwards. But whatever the century, um, they admit that this view is something that developed in the church and that it's not canonically granted from the church. They say this in section 16 in Chieti. So this fourth century view of that papal primacy is inheritance of Peter was not canonically granted by the church and identifies that the East has never shared this understanding. However particularly from the fourth century onwards, right? Particularly does not exclude an earlier pedigree, especially one that could develop from a doctrinal seed as Newman held. Hence the other postmodernist linchpin here could be perceived. And as we see, will be more explicitly delineated doctrinal development. Now the East not sharing this understanding by Chietti's admission doesn't make them right, right? At best East and West have their own truths, right? That whole postmodernist idea. And at worst, the East is holding to a fallible discipline while the West adheres to infallible developed dogma. So we could already see that the way this is being delineated, that in fact, we're junior partners as the Orthodox. We have these disciplinary canons, they're fallible, and they have these infallibly developed doctrines, these dogmas. Now, eight, and Father, interrupt if you have anything to say. All right, uh, good. Now, section 18 of Chieti, identifies that, to quote it, reception by the church as a whole has always been the ultimate criterion for the ecumenicity of a council. Right? We see this also in section six and I see it too. What do you, what's um, the quote again? But it states in that section that this, their quote is reception by the church as a whole has always been the ultimate criterion for the ecumenicity of a council. What we'll unpack is the term ecumenical apparently is an honorary title. I mean, this is in Chieti, by the way, in section 17. Right it's there. an honorary title. It doesn't mean it's a binding. They call Western councils um, general councils. Now, the Eastern view of ecumenicity is said there to have developed, to quote it, right? Making the Eastern view a binding dogmatic authority, but a doctoral development. Um, and though it's older than the Western view of Vatican I, due to relativism, this just legitim this legitimizes and vicariously delegitimizes. Uh, you gotta help me, Father. <laughs> All right. And, well, it was also and there was the also why a that's, breakup. <laughs> we couldn't hear you for for a second oh, there. That's, so that's, that's yeah. probably good because I was tripping my, over my words. So. The long story short, it says the Eastern view of ecumenicity is a development, just like the papal view of ecclesiology is a development. And so if they're both developments, neither are apostolic, right? And so neither are really objectively true. So they kind of make illegitimate both of our ecclesiologies with that sort of statement. Um, but because the Western view, this Western epistemology, doctrinal development, is literally assumed by the document in section 18, this will epistemically favor the Roman Catholics who have a postmodernist epistemology and not the Orthodox. The presumption obviously is that relativism is okay. Both views are legitimate. Um, and this is where, they, but let's talk about the conclusion of Chieti. It concludes in section 20, to quote it, the East and the West was united in preserving the apostolic faith Developing structures of synodality inseparably linked with primacy. I'm going to repeat that. The East mm. and West was united in presidency inseparably linked with primacy. All right. There's ellipsis in the middle. Um, but the point is, it's a development. And they are putting on par primacy. All right. It's inseparably linked to primacy. In fact, if it's linked to primacy, it's almost like primacy. Is the not in the middle, which we already showed. No, the binding authority is actually the synodical, the pan synodical view. 
So I view this as something where it's essentially laying the groundwork that we're going to have to understand this union in a postmodern sense. Now, the Alexandria document focuses on this, but on post schizogenic Gregorian reforms in 1.2, it says he led by the papacy through ecclesiastical innovations from the Gregorian reforms are cloaked as a traditional Roman expression and really legitimizing um, what was the, pretty much the final death of the papacy of uh, being an orthodox institution. Now, Alexandria rightly recognizes the forged nature of the pseudos during the creedals, the donation of Constantine, and it does so in one three, but it interestingly never says they were wrong, right? That's kind of like the 800 pound gorilla on the room, right? It's a forgery, great, I mean, but it's, it's the forgery wrong. Well, apparently not if it's part of legitimate development, according to Alexandria. Um, now, to quote Alexandria, they even say, quite frankly, 1.5 says the doctrinal development of Roman primacy, All right? So it identifies this is what's occurring, and it's not identified as wrong. So we could already see someone like uh, Duffy would have no problem signing on to something like this or helping tutor the bishops taking part in an ICA 2025 because the development of Roman ecclesiology is taken for granted in these joint commission statements. Now, it claims that synodality was still uh, evident in the Latin West where this papal ecclesiology was taken over. It says so without any example. It's that the Pope was bound by a vote. So, so much for consent. It pretty much says, well, might have been consent, might not have been consent, really don't know. But which leaves the door open that consent is not necessary as Vatican I teaches and decrees, which is infallible in their worldview. Now, in 1.7, um, Western ecumenical councils are called general councils. And as I referred to before, this implies they're not the same as ecumenical and are called ecumenical councils. Um, but the fact that Alexandria admits that their oppressive overtures um, to the Greeks demanding union um, on Roman terms were not being accepted implies a critique. So like they're saying, oh, well, the East wasn't accepting these general councils. But elsewhere, it, it kind of like makes the Easterners, Easterners look like curmudgeons for, for not doing this. So there's a implicit, there's a difference between an implicit critique where, you know, um, the East not accepting it makes something less legitimate and an explicit critique, okay? And I want you guys to keep that in mind. 1.8 admits, for example, that the West imposed a Latin hierarchy uh, parallel those are their words, not mine. I didn't invent the term parallel jurisdiction to the Greek patriarchates contrary to the canons, right? 1.9 decries the plundering of Constantinople and other things imposed, the quote, on the East. 1.11 extols the East for continuing to function according to the canonical privileges of Apostolic Canon 34. But despite a, condemn a condemnatory tone concerning the uncharitable nature of these things, Nowhere does the document demand the understanding that these things were schismatic, one, and that following the ecclesiastical canons is not negotiable. In fact, 1.12 puts the onus of the, for the breakdown of mutual relations, right, because that's a good thing, on the Constantinopolitan rejection of Leon in 1274. So they actually put the onus on the Orthodox, not on the Roman Catholic side. Now, 114 firmly renunciates the papal pretension to rule the world. So I guess a donation of Constantine gets thrown under the bus in, in these ecumenical discussions. But in the next section in 1.15, it rejects Western conciliarism, saying that conciliarism subverted the canonical role of the primate in the synod and jeopardized the freedom of the church. Talk about freedom as slavery, right? Like from 1984 that somehow conciliarism jeopardizes freedom in the church, that, you know, bishops have a say. And so pretty much you already start seeing it's chiseling away that say, no, synod synodality is actually against the consciousness um, of Roman ecclesiology that rightly developed. Here's a, here's a question, though. Is, are they going to say that actually conciliarism and synodicality, syn, syn, I don't know, synodicotita, is that two different things? Are they implying that the conciliarism of Basil, et cetera, is a distortion of the synodical system? 
Um, I was wondering. Yes and no, be because they, they rightly point out that uh, conciliarism was also a sacralist, meaning it had to do with state churches and stuff. It had to do with manipulation from, uh, from governments, right? And so um, conciliarism in the West is sort of like this mutation. It's like a reformation within the Roman Catholic Church. They're trying to go back to the past, but it's not the same thing as orthodoxy. And so I'm not here giving apologetic for conciliarism. I'm just showing that something that's at least analogous to certain um, synodical worldviews yes. is decried by it. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, I would say that it's probably a, it's not a totally orthodox approach, but it, you're right. It was a groping toward tradition again. You know, yes. Yeah, so it's, uh, this is covered and I forget the name of the book. It's from uh, Meyendorf and uh, oh, it's a Greek name. I'll have to write in the comment section, but they get into this, how uh, conciliarism really isn't the real deal. So just so people are aware. Now, in, in 118, Florence's view of the Pope's primacy over the world, right? So it kind of presumes upon this is a thing, is portrayed as tempered by the Greek Unionists, who added, as is also contained in the Acts, the Ecumenical Councils, and the Sacred Canon. So it's sort of like saying, yes, Florence taught the Pope as primacy over the world, but it's according to the canons and the councils. And so this is actually a moderate approach. But all of the proceeding really demonstrates that the Roman view of primacy theoretically has canonical warrant, which it absolutely does not, right? So they're cloaking themselves canonical authority they don't have. Now, we have Roman apologists claiming that uh, St. Pope Agatho taught papal infallibility in Constantinople III and Nicaea II accepted papal supremacy, which is both are definitely not the case. And so all the statement does that the Unionists added is justify what, like, again, what Roman Catholics believe about themselves. It, it doesn't actually modify or it's not a compromise in any, any sense. Now, 3.2 in Alexandria invokes papal supremacy as taught by Rome in 1848. It says it's rejected by the Orthodox Church, but it does not comment on who is right. It lets the reader decide. 3.4 takes a neo-papist view. Maybe I should let you explain what neo-papism thing, uh, neo-papism is, but it calls the ecumenical patriarch granting autocephaly the canonical mode of churches becoming autocephalous. But there, there is no canon on this. In fact, the custom has always been for pan-Orthodox acceptance. This goes back to Cyprus's autocephaly uh, during Chalcedon. I don't know if you have anything to add, Father. Yeah, I disagree with that. I would agree with what you said, and this is daily. This is definitely a big part of the neo-papist push in orthodoxy, which is at the heart of so many problems. So wherever you see a papalism, it 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 brings in its wake, the, you know, disintegration and 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 of unity, and that's exactly what's happening right now in orthodoxy. It's at the heart of the the Ukrainian schism, and it's the heart of 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 all the various divisions. I think ultimately, of course, there are a lot of problems, but that is a huge. So I think uh, there is uh, that's the claim, but there's not a lot to support it. And and they had actually reached, if I'm not mistaken, just before Crete, they had come to almost an agreement. Uh, and Constantinople had had accepted the idea that, the, of course, it has to be accepted by all the local churches. Any autocephaly has to be accepted by all the local churches. Uh, but they've dialed that back, I think, since then. It's. Um... Yeah, we could see how this is worded. It's really more towards the Greco sphere, um, where sadly it's the the schism in Ukraine kind of delineates the lines, right? Um, who's going to go what direction, at least for now? But apart from the grace of God, who knows? Anything is possible. God, all things are possible. There's a uh, just an article was just posted yeah yesterday or today today I get or yesterday, by Father Anastasio Kozopoulos, where he goes into the whole discussion that happened on the eve of Crete, in which it's abundantly clear through multiple uh, dis uh of the minutes of the discussion if you remember in january before the crete they had a final meeting of all the uh, primates uh and one of the biggest issues of course was the fear of russia that the constantinople would grant autocephaly and so they they got a con they got a, an assurance and it was repeated multiple times during this meeting we will not we will not we will not you know we're not going to give autocephaly and and so What's interesting is that there's a lot of evidence that this is a in our very recent past we've had you know the concession of an orthodox physiology and now a a, a doubling down on a very different uh, role for Constantinople. They want to reinterpret 
history and say, you know, um, that they still retain power uh, over all these uh, autocephalous churches, essentially. And there's no canon on this. And so this uh, document, the Alexandria document 3.4 is wrong. Now, it makes an interesting, it sounds like concession in 3.5. It claims that Vatican one is unbalanced, right? But now we got to channel our inner Mike Lofton and look at, all right, well, how do councils reform one another where they could fix these things? And so Vatican one is unbalanced, not because it was wrong because they're in teaching on the papacy. It never states that but because it did not likewise teach on synodality. Now, what is this view of synodality? Now, as 3.6 details, the conciliarity, uh, that conciliarity is subservient to papal supremacy um, because it teaches on direct jurisdiction, parallel churches, ex cathedra dogmatic decrees are respect of the consent of episcopacy and et cetera. These things are acceptable. I don't see how you balance those things with pap of papal supremacy with a authentically uh, synodal worldview. Uh, the reality is you can't. You can only create subservient links to the chain. They, Three point. They, I'm sorry. They seem to want to give the impression that their vision and view of of infallibility in Vatican One is not what is plainly stated in Vatican One. That when I was reading it, I was thinking they're they're basically like leaving that there with an idea that and because they say later on we're going to reinterpret the role and how just how infallible is the Pope and and how how where does his jurisdiction extend over the East, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're reading it, it's like they state that they state it, but they they want to give you the impression, which is not at all clear from anything. There's never there's no there's, no, there's nothing to substantiate that impression, but that hey, that's that's basically going to be reinterpreted in the light of conciliarity. We're going to, we're going to like somehow merge these two and make uh, them live together. I'm going to show that in reality, they even specify that the only explicit function of the synod is to act as advisors. Hmm. What good is that? Right. Advisors to the well, king pretty much. And so, it. so we could see why they left the door open that way. Cause the role of the synod really is just to advise. Um, 3.7 even defends infallibility, papal infallibility. 3.8 defends universal jurisdictions, or universal jurisdiction, and resistance to these ideas is recognized but minimized in 3.9. 4.7 um, speaks of a balance that Vatican II struck between Pope and the rest of the Episcopacy, which remained open at Vatican I. So this balance during Vatican II is that, to quote it, the Episcopate assisted the Pope in, in an advisory and consultative a consultative capacity. So they assisted the Pope in an advisory and consultative uh, capacity. How nice of Pope John the 23rd to allow that to happen, right? Uh, I guess they just uh, squared the circle that way. So if uh, the Orthodox go into union, I mean, what's in it for the Orthodox? Uh, they, they, they drop their synodal system where everyone is equal so they could, ex they could assist as theological consultants. I mean, what kind of balance is this? And that's why I said before, the reality is Vatican I is heretical. And it cannot be balanced. It's it's an ideology um, that cannot be balanced according to unchanging sacred tradition. Hmm. Now, 310 states that Vatican I teaching a papal primacy of jurisdiction of the church and papal infallibility was considered unacceptable by the Orthodox Church. Such an ecclesiology is for the Orthodox. I just want to emphasize that. A serious departure from the canonical tradition of the fathers and the ecumenical councils. So I cannot help but uh, infer that it's not a serious departure for the Roman Catholics and their developed papal doctrine. It's only a serious departure for the Orthodox and their canons. Orthodox critiques, in fact, are quaintly polemical and not meeting historically critical muster. So it actually even says like their critiques of these Vatican I teachings are polemical, uncharitable is what they would say these days, and they're not meeting historically critical muster, so they're just unenlightened. Right, unlike this developed papal doctrine in Vatican I. Now, 3.11 represents Pope Leo XIII as accepting unions with open arms, having recognized their distinct rights, whatever those are, it doesn't really say. He kindly invited all the Orthodox to union with the Church of Rome on the condition that they recognize papal primacy of jurisdiction. You know, how nice of him. He's inviting them. And ecumenical patriarch Athemus VII, this curmudgeon, he's a meanie. He expressed a strongly negative opinion of unionism and as a method of proselytizing Orthodox Christians and rejected Pope Leo's invitation. I mean, you know, 
How dare he break down mutual relations like that? I mean, that's clearly the tone of what's going on here. Um, it's incredible that this was accepted, how insulting. <laughs> the whole idea that the Orthodox and being true to their canons were being polemical and and refusing invitations and stuff. Um, I don't know. It's To me, it's incredible. It's a very pro-Roman document. Uh, 4.9 to 10 includes similar syrupy language about popes in recent years inviting the coded Orthodox to preside with them and accept their primacy. Again, you know, how sweet of them to let us become consultants, right? Now, there are some like weird, uh, interesting concessions. Um, like 4.2 gives a positive uh, view of the concept of sobernost, right? Um, but it puts it also puts Vatican II and Crete 2016 on the same par, despite the latter's lack of reception presently. Um, but it's interesting that it would even say that Crete 2016 could be a council like Vatican II. Um, it just shows you what you know they're willing to dogmatize. Because I would guess, Father, maybe you could speak to this, that in any agreement they probably decree that neo papism is the um, the doctrine of the Orthodox Church and that the Pope is primacy over the neo Pope, something like that. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what kind of compromise they're gonna they're gonna make. But I mean, people people are talking about uh, dividing the church up east and west and having like a you know, slightly higher Pope, but basically functionally, they're going to be independent. So uh, a lot of speculation. I don't know. We'll see. Well, back to uh, it's uh, not speculation. It's in the document. 5.1, um, Alexandra claims, it is clear that for Roman Catholics, synodality is not merely consultive, right? Like it explicitly was talking about. And for Orthodox primacy, is not merely honorific. And so during this document, we're given these concrete examples of primacy, right? Of the, the infallibility, of supremacy, of infallibility, uh, parallel jurisdictions, um, direct jurisdiction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But no examples of where, uh, other than being a, uh, uh, an advisor or a consultant. And so it's really, there's, they're just saying it's not merely consult, uh, consultative, but there's just, there's no beef behind it. There's, it's just a nice sounding statement. Just like they say uh, things about our canons, but they're not ultimately binding. Um, so I, I see this as just the use of affirm, uh, affirming language, you know, about our episcopacy, but not much more than that. Um, I also think it ironically inverts the ancient practice of the ecumenical councils of using accepting affirming language about the Pope, but demanding consensus-based ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical norms. So anyone who reads the councils, right, they'll find rarely, but they exist, these very flowery statements about the Pope of Rome. By the way, you also find flowery statements about other people, but be that as it may, you'll find flowery statements about the Pope of Rome. But at the end, and some, they demand a consensus-based ecclesiology. They demand that everyone has a say and consensus um, determines that everyone agrees and that's what settles the issue. So we actually see the opposite. In the past, they use affirm affirming language for the Pope and, syn and synodality won the day. And in the present, they use an affirming language about synodality, but the Pope wins the day. Hmm. Um, it's, to me, pretty clear, having read all the ecumenical councils and all their acts, uh, that that's what's going on. Now, 5.4 states hmm. uh, the following. The quote, the interdependence of synodality and primacy is a fundamental principle in the life of the church. Um, but as we've already went over, we could see how this is a one-way road particularly them putting primacy on par with synodality, which is not the case according to sacred tradition. Now, that's it for the Alexandria document, but I have some comments on Pope Francis' address to the delegation the Ecumenical Patriarchate on June 30th of this year, because he, he comments on the document, if you have uh, some time for that, Father. Yes, yes, let's do it. So the Pope endorses the Alexandria statement, right? This is not something written without his approval, but he dropped the following bombshell. The quote, the Pope, uh, Pope Francis, a clarification is fitting, right? So we can already see him modifying what was stated. It cannot be thought that the same prerogatives that the Bishop of Rome enjoys with regard to his own diocese and the Catholic community should be extended to the Orthodox communities. The form in which the Bishop of Rome will exercise his service of communion in the church at the universal level will have to be the result of an inseparable relationship between primacy and synodality. So, it appears that Pope Francis is asserting that all the developments we just spoke of, right, all those papal developments, 
can just apply to the present Roman Catholic communion and the Orthodox can carry on their own ecclesiology. Like you were saying before, Father Peter, they will be right. like a junior Pope in the East and they will be pretty much independent from the uh, Pope in the West. But I want people to notice what he means by this because he says the form which the Bishop Rome will exercise his service will be a relationship inseparable between primacy and synodality. Right, the form of ecclesiology the Bishop Rome plans to exercise is that which is delineated uh, by um, the Alexandria document. So all those previous critiques I made, they equally apply with this caveat he makes, right? Because it was affirming direct jurisdiction, it was affirming infallibility, it was affirming parallel jurisdictions, um, it was affirming all <laughs> these things. So all it's really setting the stage for, which makes a ton of sense is that the Orthodox would effectively be allowed to carry on like the Melkites today and pretend that they're independent, right? So this and and, and that's, what the, that's, the, that's what this is a setup for. This, the, this <laughs> language reminds me very much of the Constitution of the Church, 13 and 14, I think it is, and elsewhere, where you have essentially two paragraphs that seem, at least from an Orthodox perspective, to be contradictory. Where, But one is talking about Rome alone, and the other one is talking about all the rest of and so they're 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 applying two standards, and so it seems like they're writing these documents. When I, as an Orthodox, read it, I'm reading it in an Orthodox perspective, and I'm reading it. And you know, if I'm a simple, good-hearted folks, and I don't have a lot of you know experience, I well, this sounds good. I mean, they're they're acknowledging. You said, well, they're actually affirming. A lot of people say they're acknowledging that they set up a parallel jurisdiction, and this is a bad thing. And but you're saying no, actually, the end result will be that they're affirming it. There they're affirming it, and there, there isn't and the condemnation in the document. The there there's none because it defines the papal ecclesiology as a pretty much a tension between synodality and primacy, and we already know so all synodality is is consultive and primacy is they get to do everything. So I I, I don't see the compromise there. It's sort of like all right, if the Pope, because they've been really hands off the Melkites, which they don't have to be, by the way, nothing dogmatically. Bounds the, binds them to be hands off the Melkites. The Melkites could do most of what they want, right? And so I don't doubt that's what they let the Orthodox do. But then they they just be more Melkites. Um, that that's the model they're looking to follow. Now, um, Pope Francis states that uh, the communion, the quote, in between believers is not a matter of concessions and compromises, right? Like it's not about like repentance, but a fraternal charity. Right? So he admits that communion is being sought without any side repenting of anything, but simply looking past each other's dis differences. So it, this kind of telegraphs the ideology behind it. And I just want to apologize for this to the audience. It comes across I'm sounding very cynical, but reading too many ecumenical councils will do that to you. You get very used to the very precise legal language and the way they set up arguments and what they mean by it. And that's why this presentation started with precisely what is the postmodernist worldview of, that's pretty much a consensus within the Roman uh, episcopacy and scholarship. Um, because they have a very particular way of, they will look at things in that context, all that matters is their dogmatic decrees. And following that, that will mean that they're not going to give up anything. They can even say that they did, but they're not going to give it up. And, and that's, that's where we're going, because I know that this back and forth is confusing, right? It sounds confusing because only a lawyer could begin to understand this stuff. And this is why the joint statements are not going to heal the schism. Saying we have a big misunderstanding or your side is mostly right, my side's mostly wrong, or we sort of write about this, or you're sort of right about that, or let's just look past everything. It's not going to cut it. There is, here's the solution, and, it, and it's simple, and it will work. Everything in the West after the schism is wrong. Right, it, it's not part of the Orthodox Church. It's not part of our inheritance. The Orthodox Catholic Church needs to pose the Roman Catholic something similar to what they posed the Anglicans in 1721. Accept these councils, accept these Orthodox confessions, denounce everything else. Right? They weren't being curmudgeons. They were actually posing the Anglicans. This is what you need to do to become Orthodox. It's the same thing we have to pose the Roman Catholics. So, and, and I'm not crazy. I'm not stupid. I know this sounds stubborn if not even mean, but let's just be honest. What other solution is there? You can't smooth over repentance with many words and opaque reasonings. One has to objectively recognize that they're wrong and change what they're doing. The orthodox ecclesiology is right. 
The Apostolic Canon, Apostolic Canon 34 existed since the 2nd and 3rd century, and its precedents precede them. The Orthodox ecclesiology is apostolic and from the 1st century. The Roman ecclesiology is wrong, so wrong, in fact, it admittedly took far into the Middle Ages to develop. There is nowhere to compromise between something that's apostolic and something that is a mutation of the faith. So, in summary... As what we discovered demonstrates, we do not yet have the proper intellectual and spiritual climate um, for a union. There's little expression of repentance on either side. In repentance instead, there's this postmodernism that this, you know, uh, these doctrines can develop. We don't know what they meant. We can reinterpret these things to make them right and, and these sort of things. And these are fine legal reasonings and academic reasonings. And it can make both sides sound like they feel right and validate both their views and their respective sociocultural and historical context. But where the rubber meets the road is making these truths work with one another. Alexandria shows that clearly that this is intended to lead to an um, to an unrepentant acceptance of papal supremacy with synodality being a subservient auxiliary function of the church. That's where this is going to lead. All right, that's where the rubber is going to meet the road because ultimately there's going to have to be some sort of work and arrangement and as we talked about before, it's a side with more power when there's no objective truth that determines what people have to believe. And that's what's going to happen. Um, so while there may be union in 2025 or sometime in the future, which may even say the filioque is subordinationist, the papacy is a development and not apostolic, Western soteriology is wrong, and whatever else, you know, indulgences, not commuting infants, not chrismating infants, etc., what won't be compromised is that papal supremacy is not only ahist is uh, ahistorical, but wrong and heretical. They, they're not going to say it's wrong and heretical. They're not going to do that. And without this being acceded to the to by the Roman episcopacy and inculcated into their laity, right? They got to teach the Roman Catholic faithful the Orthodox faith if they're going to become Orthodox. There cannot be a real union, not one that will last and have any real spiritual benefit. Now. If I hope I'm getting the right saying, I think it's St. Isaac the Syrian said, life has been given to us for repentance. So everything we ought to be doing is a continuous act of repentance. Union must be no different than this. And so that's that, Father, that's all my thoughts on the Alexandria document, Chieti, um, the role of postmodernism. And I think what people should see is this is not the victory people see if they understand the mindset, the ethos that's behind it. Yeah, I think is a great, great contribution to the Orthodox dialogue on this thing because we have other brothers in Christ who've done an analysis. And of course, on one in one level, we do have a lot of victories, like you said. There's a lot of concessions. If people are in the weeds and they've been debating this and they've been going through it for a long time, and there's points made by you know apologists, not really people who are a part of the Vatican or even representing the thousands, but you know the. The guys, the recent converts of into Catholicism, and now they've become zealous apologists for it. They they have been putting forth, you know, the full uh, nine yards of Catholic apologies, uh, apologetics, and this do the document Alexandria seems to undermine some of those, you know, uh, points. But as you point out, it's all very misleading, and it's all within certain presuppositions that need to be understood behind all this. And if it doesn't lead to serious repentance of on dogmatic definitions and heretical teachings, then it's, you know, as they say in Greek, it's a gift that has been basically taken back or a gift that never was given. Um, and so uh, that's in this, it's a really, this needs to be put into play. So when we're analyzing these documents, when we're talking about the dialogue, and I think really importantly, when we're approaching 2025 and we're saying, well, what's going to happen there? What are we going to see? We're going to see big concessions. A lot of people think there's going to be big concessions. What does that mean? And there's going to be, a, I think, a very uh, robust uh, public relations campaign, uh, as, there, as there always has been, but even more so. Uh, there will. Here's my guess. And this is just a guess, and I hope I'm wrong. I think things are going to get worse in the world. Generally, I think we're going to get closer to World War III. We're going to get a very bad economic situation. We're going to have an increase in totalitarianism. And th there's going to be a lot of turmoil in the world going forward, unfortunately. I, I hope I'm wrong. But it does seem that that's a possibility. And that'll be put into play as, as a part of this psychological pressure that, hey, look at this. This is an amazing thing. Just, a, just at this, this historical 
uh, crossroads where we have so many temptations and struggles and pressure and 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 we as Christians we need to unite for the sake of the world etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. so anything that looks like hey the doors have been open to sincere repentance or at least a you know a real change on the part of the papacy the orthodox people are going to be inundated with um, with a lot of calls to to just go along hey we'll, and as as my professor said to me 15 years ago we'll figure that out after the union don't worry about it. What's important is this, you know, the question of primacy. Now, I, I even think the filioque is pretty much not even, a, a, you know, debated anymore, right? Is it really an issue? People have already said, I think Closer Square famously said, no, it's not really an issue anymore. So unbelievably so. Like, what, when did it not stop, cease to be an issue? How did that happen exactly? When, what dogmatic, what council, what, nothing. But in any case, let's just assume that is. Now we're only talking about the role of the Pope. We're only talking about the papacy. And that seems to be the whole focus of these documents, as if the filioque doesn't exist, creative grace doesn't exist, you know, these variety of other very problematic teachings and practices don't exist. And so if we can appear to have given all kinds of concessions and figured out, you know, a way for these things to, they're inseparable and they must coexist and, and you know, be a symphonia, let's say, uh, of conciliar and papal ecclesiologies, you and I and anybody else is going to stand up and say, "No, the emperor has no clothes. This is this is a this is fake. This is not real. This is there's no real repentance." You, we will be as what did you say, curmudgeons? We're going to be, yeah. we're, going to be <laughs> we're going to be accused of, as as really backwards fundamentalist uh, and just you know pile on the the ad adjectives. And the um, ironic thing, the ironic thing, Father. It's them that the ecclesiastical Pentecostals, they they're the ones decontextualizing everything. But but we're we are the people living on the rocks. <laughs> That's right. Get with it. Get with the age. That's a fan, it was a fantastic uh, presentation. I hope that you'll turn this into. Uh, well, it's already been there's already been one article written. Is mm -hmm. that is that it? Is that do you feel that's complete? Or are you going to add to that? I mean, I feel it's complete. Like maybe I'll update the script to this if people want to read it. Um, but uh, yeah, there's an article: Can Union Be Achieved Through Decontextualizing History? Um, on my website, OrthodoxChristianTheology.com, and uh, and people could get more detail on on it there because there's also things there that I cover in that article, not covered um, in this presentation. Right here, right? Oh, where do we go? We, lost we got it. Google there. I don't know. <laughs> I had it and then I lost it. There it is. There it is. All right. Look at so that. that's the that's the article that this but this seems more extensive than what we, uh, what we just had was more extensive than the article. You It's more well they're both more extensive in particular respects. Like so in that article I actually get into the details the subordinationism and uh to things of that effect. All right, so we direct everybody over there if they want to have a lot of what they saw tonight, they want to have the the, the references and the and, and and the quotations and things like that, you'll find most of it over in that article. How about we open it up to questions? Sure. I think we we have a, a Panos who's doing our our uh, you know uh, what do you call it moderator tonight. So anybody who's with us, we're going to open up the uh, chat. The chat should have been opened up, Panos. If you haven't, it needs to be opened up so people can submit their questions. And is that? To John, John, you cannot open it. So that's something that John uh, should have should have informed us how to open up the chat. So we won't be able to take questions if we can't open up the chat. Well, there's so, always there's always the com box. Yeah. <laughs> so on the page itself in YouTube, people can can they can they no they can't. It's all in live stream. Yeah, I, I only because I only see a few questions that pop up uh, here. Like one of them is, so is like, John is John following things? Is he here? He's not with us. So how do we open it up? Because like someone asked, like Katerina Ambrose, what areas in Orthodoxy are being developed, and which sure. ones are most likely to be put forth in order to attempt union with Rome? There you go. Go with that until we get and figure out the. Uh, yeah, I mean that's a cogent question. I mean. The Orthodox viewpoint is nothing's being developed, right? Uh, we're, we're preserving the Orthodox faith. Um, what questions could be clarified? I think the obvious question is the issue of autocephaly, which uh, 
historically speaking, it's very clear. And that's why when, if God raises up a pan Orthodox council to solve the question, um, they'll be saying, this is the teaching of the fathers. You know, you need a pan Orthodox acceptance of, uh, recognizing the autocephaly of the church. So yeah, that could be developed, but we could already name precedents with Georgia and Cyprus, uh, that are even uh, Ephesus when they get really in the weeds in the second century, uh, things that are very old. Um, and so I, I just leave that there. Um, what Rome's going to put forth, is I, I personally feel they're going to use even more Fermi language, stuff that's going to make Alexandria look even more uh, less syrupy compared to what they're going to come out with in order to really sweeten um, the union. Um, so I think they're just going to try to develop their own doctrines to make them sound orthodox, is my opinion. Okay, we've got this question here. Uh, it's got cut off because I can only put so much of it on the screen. Let me tell you, let me read you the question. You got half of it there. But it says, uh, how could the Catholics ever enter into union with the orthodox without doing away with their false saints? Mm -hmm. In a false union, would those Orthodox, quote-unquote, who entered into that union be forced to recognize post-schism Western saints? That's post-schism Western saints. Would they be forced to recognize them? I mean, ironically, um, my article on the website addresses this, so there you go. <laughs> but I will give the answer, um, which is what we'll see is they'll just let everyone have their own saints, just like they have with the unions. Um, this is unacceptable, obviously. Um, how could we have union with the Oriental Orthodox when they're saying Dioscorus is a saint and he's condemned by our church? It's not possible. Uh, how could we have uh, papal supremacist uh, post-schism popes as saints, which they pretty much all are in the Roman Catholic Church, um, and being communion with those people, people venerating them? I mean, it's, it's not acceptable. And th this is the sad thing because people love their saints. And I think the saints would rubber meets the road. Are you willing to anathematize the Oscars? Are you willing to anathematize, um, uh, was Pope Gregory the seventh Hildebrand? Well, I forget what his Pope name was. I think it's Gregory the seventh. Are you willing to anathematize these people? And if they're not, then they're clearly not on the same page uh, with the Orthodox and there's no repentance. And so then there can't be any union. Here's another question. Do we have do you have an idea on the state of various patriarchates and their attitudes to these papist proposals? Is there wide resistance or could some interorthodox chaos be around the corner? The other Paul. Yeah, you know better than uh, me, Father. The other Paul is actually the producer of The Errors of the Catholics, which would be out tomorrow night. So uh, oh, check that out. Yeah, if, by the way. Let's share that, uh, if you don't mind, let's share that, um, oh, not that one. Let's share that page so people can see it. It's coming out tomorrow night, and here it is. In 35 minutes, you will learn more about the crucial dogmatic errors of the post-schism Roman Catholic Church um, than you've learned with years of following apologetics. It's all condensed primary source uh, research and the best secondary uh, resource, great production, and pretty much I purposely made it so I could kind of be done with a lot of these historical questions. It, this, this will be a resource for years to come. So guys, check it out. Errors of the Catholics uh, tomorrow night, go. eight o'clock. But answer the other Paul's question. My opinion, which I would consider myself ignorant because I'm more of a uh, recreational historian. I, I do history. I don't really follow current events super close. Um, my inkling is the Greeks would be the ones that would go into this. And I think it's their governments are pushing it. And I think the, the lines are delineated with the schism in Ukraine because um, Greek diplomats went to Alexandria and then the Alexandrian said it over time, they went over the patriarch and they won them over and they're hammering away at Cyprus and the Greeks in Greece our civil servants, the Greek government, and they went along with it because they're part of NATO. And so the reality is that there's a very large chance that a lot of the uh, Greek churches um, will end up going into union if the circumstances demands that they, the movers and shakers want it. That's my, my understanding. My understanding uh, on this question, uh, which is not very extensive, but I do talk uh, occasionally to some people who do know a lot in Greece, 
and that in Alexandria there were objections posited by the Church of Georgia. And this is the same thing that happened previously on multiple occasions, including in, in, in Jordan, when they had the meeting in Jordan. A very key uh, and important objection was tabled by the Church of Georgia. Uh, and it was decisive, I think, at that meeting to kind of, you know, keep things somewhat on a more better better path, although it doesn't seem that that's the case anymore. Any case, the Church of Georgia did did have that, uh, and I think the Church of uh, there were several churches that were not present in Alexandria, of course. Uh, I'm not sure which, but I'm gonna guess, uh, of course, Russia. I don't think Bulgaria sent representatives. Do you know? I don't think so. So I don't believe so, but I'm not aware. It doesn't really represent a pan orthodox decision. And so, what the people who are signing Alexandria are going to be mainly from Patriarchate of Constantinople, Patriarchate of Alexandria, Church of Cyprus, the Church of Greece. I don't know what role, if I mean, Jerusalem was, I think, present. So, I don't know what role they played if, if they had objections. Of course, the objections really never reached the light of day, right? You don't hear about them publicly. The, the documents come out as if they're unanimous, and oftentimes there's at least a couple that are objecting. Uh, and then uh, among the other local church, patriarchates, I would think that Romania, among the theologians, uh, is probably the most susceptible uh, of the non-Greek uh, speaking uh, patriarchates to accept uh, this postmodernist uh, solution. Um, and then beyond that, it's hard to say. I don't know. I don't have that much insight into the Slavic churches. Serbia is is, is definitely uh, a mixed bag, I think. But the representatives are probably on the more uh, lenient side. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that gives you a little insight. So chaos could be around the corner if that's what you're asking, Paul. I think that's that's not a, not un, totally unlikely. We have this. Is this a question? Probably need a small book on the Roman Catholic side, but is there anything you can think that the EO need to repent for union? Yeah, our, our quasi-postmodernism, right? Um, we have people that are traditional that decry the contextualist view of the councils that I was talking about here. We have scholars that decry that. Um, I would say we'd also need very clear statements uh, ultimately on life after death pertaining to toll houses uh, against universalism. We definitely have a, a larger um, we have a larger contingent in orthodoxy that entertains some of these heterodox things than even to our shame, the Roman Catholics on those same questions. So there there's there's definitely things uh, that we would need to re concretely repent of in a doctrinal way, uh, let alone just, the collapse of our spiritual disciplines, which is getting worse, I feel. Um, but these are, a lot these are, I think the question was that that the papists are asking us to repent of. Oh yeah, like, no, nothing with them. We we, we retained the faith. It's, yeah. uh, <laughs> but we got things to repent of in our, in our own right. But not in order to to for their union to be achieved. I mean, if 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 it had to be clarified, it would be fine to say. We reaffirm the canon, canon one of Consulpa three, uh, canon twenty eight of Chalcedon, and I forget the canon in in uh, in Trullo, which reiterates the same thing. That yes, you know, you would have primacy in councils, you would have uh, primacy for non binding appellate appeals, um, and we'd also have to specify that the the canon of Sardica has a local interpretation, uh, with according to our canonist. But so yeah, there'd be like a little there because like. But the little would not be – would be more just to undo some of the polemical things that have been said. So particularly I'm, I'm going very fundamentalist here. I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb and uh, risk it. <laughs> go ahead and risk it. <laughs> so if I had somebody coming back – let's say we had a parish. We were in a parish, a small parish or a big parish. And there was somebody who was very vocal and departed from the parish, screaming and yelling and, and said, I'm going to start my own parish over here. And actually took a lot of people out of our parish and started his own parish down the road. And then, and then he, he decided, well, he wanted union with our parish again. And he started, let's go back and let's, let's forge a union. Would, I, would, would, the, would that person uh, merit uh, any kind of authority in the church after he returned? Would we give him a, a privacy of honor or place? Would, I mean, 
this is what's so bizarre here is that in every other way, if we had anything on a more mundane level, nobody, the, the, the Apostle Paul, nobody would say, yeah, put him above everybody. I mean, not above, but, you know, um, first among equals and to, let's let's have him guide us uh, and consider, you know, bring everybody together, be a touchstone, be the there's nothing automatic because he's the Bishop of Rome that says he has some magical power of, of, of rightly dividing the word truth. This is exactly the papist delusion. So what makes him uh, re re retain that, which he had the first millennium? I know that saints have said that, like St. Simeon of Thessaloniki said, we'll give you that if you come back to the faith as a kind of back then it was a lot simpler, right? It was, it was 1300. So people were still, imagining that there's there's not the chasm is not as big today it's massive the chasm i think there's a solution curious, like, people say it with a straight face then i, I kind of wonder like when would we ever do that when would anybody like a monk leave a monastery and then come back and be the abbot i mean it just wouldn't happen like so why why is it happening in in the ecumenical dialogue well so, but maybe maybe they could do that reaffirm the canons depose the present pope and and elect one <laughs> that's, that's all <laughs> That's probably the only solution. Bring him back for, for the sake of the faithful, and then depose him, uh, because I mean, one for the team. Half the, what, well, you know, the, here's the irony of it: is half of Catholicism would be thrilled if Francis was deposed. Right? That's what I'm saying. We might be able to get people on board with this, you know. And um, <laughs> we can, we can and it's not like you know a lot of converts from Catholicism if we depose them. Yeah, it's not like all our patriarchs are that great. So, like, if let's say the Melkite patriarch is like, all right, you know. I'll drop all this papal stuff and, you know, and play ball a little bit. And they, they elect him. And as long as he stays in the straight and narrow, we won't depose him. <laughs> Who knows? You know, again, that's never going to happen. There's some people yeah, never, gonna ever going to happen because exactly. again, this union's not being pushed with good intentions. It's being pushed for geopolitical uh, reasons. It's not being pushed with repentance. So it's not like we're going to actually be coming to the table with, all right, how do we fix this the right way, right? That that that's really not what's happening here. So, I, it's a fun thought experiment what we yes. just did, but it's right. not the reality we're going to be. Yeah, doing. yeah, of course. All right. So the question here, John, and on what would happen with Mount Athos and the monasteries of Elder Fem? Uh, and I guess he's asking me this question. Well, I mean, I, they're not going to go along with any kind of union where there's no repentance. So I think we know what's going to happen. It's pretty pretty obvious. I can't imagine any any Athenite who's has the tradition of Athos and saints for spiritual fathers. I don't think anybody who's going to you know say, yeah, let's um, let's throw it all away and um, and 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 go go postmodern. No, it's not going to happen. You know, it's interesting. I just want to say, like, there's there's no postmodernists among the saints. We got academics, right? We got you know, we'll have canonized soon, Father Dimitri Staniloy. But like even he's against Newman. He's against the linchpins of the exact problems we're dealing with. So it's it's worth reflecting upon. Wouldn't it be better to try to bring back union with those closer to us first, such as genuine Orthodox or Roca? Shouldn't we fix the calendar issue before taking on such a lofty task as Catholicism? I think so, right? Get your own house in order. Um, yeah, this, this is not, our, our discussion tonight is not implying that that's not a, a, a a more immediate uh, necessity in, in the least. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, let me ask you this, Father, like with the calendar issue, if they were able to make the Manayan intact, so that way the uh, Manayan could, you know, actually we don't lose the Apostles Fast and we keep all the same stays and the stuff that's been ruined by the new calendar. They actually did it right. I mean, would they, in your view, would you think modifying the calendar if the Manayan was made where it worked be acceptable, or do you just think people can't handle that? So I'm assuming the Manayan is the Manayan, because that's how we saw it, say it. In, in well, I, uh, you, you say it, yes. You say it. You say Manayan, I say Manayan. <laughs> so, oh, there's, tomato, only one, yeah. there's only one truth. It's the person who speaks Greek. <laughs> <laughs> the Greeks have always, are always correct on language. Anyway. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure how that would happen. Like, how would you do? How would you do new calendar and not lose the Manan and the and the and the apostles fast? Is it? Oh, possible? I don't know. I, I I leave people that know math better than me. Okay. <laughs> I, 
I think what here's here's my take, and it, you know it's probably worth nothing, but here's my take is that what needs to happen is there needs to be repentance on the part of the innovators mm -hmm. who who chose to, to divide the Orthodox in this way with the calendar innovation and basically not not to honor Orthodox ecclesiology. That's the real sin, I think, is that they trampled upon Orthodox ecclesiology, they trampled upon Orthodox unity in terms of the, the calendar. Uh, that needs to be repented of. And then at that point, when that is done away with and those 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 stumbling blocks are done away with, and we actually put our brother first, and we say that like Saint Tikhon said, like he introduced the new calendar in Russia. And then he saw where it was going. He said, nope. And he dialed it back because he saw that the renovationists were going new calendar. The communists wanted a new calendar. And he said, that's a mistake. We're not doing that. And he dialed it back and they didn't go new calendar. But he didn't have, St. Tikhon didn't have a problem per se, it seems, with the 13 days. He had a problem with the church disunity, obviously. And that's that's what those who introduced the innovation should have thought about first and foremost and most of all, right? So so that has to be repented of how we actually work out the apostles fast, the 13 days. To me, it's very, it's quite secondary. Like, and I question I've been wanting to get answered. I'm sure there's somebody who can answer for me. I don't know. If we were to go back a thousand years or 1200 years or 1500 years, would the apostles fast be two, three, four, five weeks, sometimes four weeks, whatever, or would it have been more like two weeks? The, you know, yeah, it's been. The, the liturgical seasons, um, orthopraxy does have development, right? There was a, a day when there wasn't a feast for the Dormition, and then there was a yeah. day there was, because we actually yeah. know the day and time when it happens. So it seems to me the church, as long as there's consensus, um, could change these things. But uh, my opinion is, Father, not being a clergyman and, and hence thereby being more ignorant of these pastoral concerns, um, which are very important, is the testimony of the church that we have them now shows that, in a sense, we have found that this is what is beneficial for people's salvation. So you don't just get rid of it, right? The Apostles Fast, as it is, has proven in time to be beneficial to people's salvation. So we're going to retain this practice. But we might take a practice that gets introduced, like the new calendar, and go, this is not beneficial. It creates division. It creates modernism. And then throw out the practice. And so, in a sense, the church is dynamic where we're willing to apply and test spiritual disciplines, and the ones that are beneficial will increase and will be protected by the church. So I think that that would be the angle that I have to look at it, yeah, without, is my without, ignorant opinion. Just to apply the same thing we're talking about with Catholicism, without repentance, there's not going to be a unity between, you know, for the, for the uh, around the question of the calendar. And there has to be repentance of what's been innovated, and so... Um, in my opinion, that's the only way that's going to end. And uh, now there, there might be a case to be made that there needs to be repentance on the part of the so-called genuine slash old calendar jurisdictions. In fact, that they didn't, they didn't follow patristic methodology uh, in fighting heresy and they've divided and been divided amongst themselves multiple times and they divided from the rest of the Orthodox. So there may be, that needs to be repented of as well so there's multiple things going on not just a question of, of a of a calendar in 13 days and and there's multiple things that need to be repented of and i think that um those uh those are you know in sim in, in some way and it's a little bit similar but anyway that's off topic uh let's see if we've got any other questions here uh let's go back to crowdcast we had a couple questions there Distinguish between acts and decrees of council. Somebody's asking, Diana's asking, can you please distinguish between the acts and the decrees of councils, which I'll put here on the screen momentarily. I have to avoid giving a, a too highly technical of an answer. But in generally, a decree of the council is a conclusion they reach in the end on the real point of debate. So in Council of Nicaea, it would be Arianism is wrong. And Constantinople one, it'd be that eunomianism was wrong. Uh, Ephesus Nestorianism is wrong, et cetera, et cetera, right? So like the decree will decree in this. And the decree, and given its final judgment, will also mention other things. And generally, actually almost, well, generally, not all the councils, it will then give canons that are disciplinary and also be uh, informed by the doctrines taught by that decree. 
But the way they arrive at the decree is through a bunch of minuted, minuted sec, uh, sessions, which we call the acts of the council. Kind of like when you go to court and the person's got that weird keyboard and they write everything everyone says. They had they had the ancient version of that in the councils. There's some diversity in how they did the recording, but I won't get into that. Um, but the way they arrive at the conclusion is through their studies and through their reflections earlier in the council, which are reflected in the minutes. And so the minutes offer the context in which we understand um, the decree, but also they will sometimes touch on secondary things that reveal the minds of the fathers that come up with the decree. And so, for example, the main issue in the fifth council wasn't origin and universalism, but it did come up, it did come up among the fathers during the time the council is going and they speak about it in passing. And so traditionally, the fifth council decrees on the issue of originism, even though it's literal decree doesn't have that origin is by the way, anathematized in its literal decree, by the way. Um, and this kind of uh, hagiographic gloss of the fifth council is canonized by Canon one of uh, Trullo and also in the decree of uh, Nicaea two. So it's not something that they were unaware of because they would have took for granted the context of the council in the minutes, even where it was held, right? There's icons in the wall, informs its meaning. Um, in my article, I even get into how they publish the council is something that is part of this process, but I don't want to get too in the weeds there. Has there ever been a Roman Catholic bishop or their metropolitan equivalent ever in mass come to orthodoxy? It seems like something you just never see. I mean, in Russia, they would have had that for throughout the 1800s into the early 1900s. We have Alexis Toth, who came back. He was a priest. He wasn't. He was a bishop. priest. He brought many parishes with him. It happened. Then you, a lot of former unions were brought back. Uh, if they were to say the question, well, how about Latin right Roman Catholics? Um, I'm not aware of that. And in and in a large degree, it's because the um, Imperial Russia was rather tolerant of its subjects of all different religions. And so really the only motivation was to bring Orthodox back on the same page. And just slowly over time, um, maybe some um, Latin right people would, they had to choose between Roman Catholic and Orthodox and some would choose to be Orthodox, but the majority would stay Latin right. And so the Uniates, they could choose to be Latin or Orthodox would choose to be Orthodox. Um, it's an interesting question, but it's more among the Uniates, not among the Latin right Catholics. Uh Max, the confessor, says union seems unlikely among even the more lib churches. I personally think that these documents will just lead to egg on people's face. That's possible. I mean, you can speak to this better than me, Father. I mean, the Greeks are a proud people. Is there a sort of like this popular uproar that would occur for them to be second fiddle for anything, right, when it comes to like something so steeped in their history? Like, could it backfire just because of Greek prejudice? I think that I think that the if we're if we are going to see a false union in a year or two, it's going to be something like this, where uh, there'll be the core, the monastic, ascetic, traditional core, which exists, of course, on on Athos in Greece and in the church in Jerusalem, etc. They're not going to go anywhere. They're going to remain. They're not going to go with the union, but the but the secularized. Uh, you know, larger portion uh, will 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 joyfully uh, joyfully go along and follow those bishops who are who are really eager for a union, and um, <clears throat> they are uh, they're going to be sold that this is this is not at all uh, humiliating, uh, and and in fact it's a tremendous victory. That's why they're going to go. It's going to be like, hey, we've arrived at this moment, the fruit of ecumenism. We've we've achieved this uh, great victory. I, I think that's why I agree with you that there's going to be many concessions to give that impression. Uh, so that's what that's that's possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, what are your thoughts on the overly rationalist approach from the Roman Catholics? What are the ramifications of this approach that even the Orthodox can fall victim to? Well, they are like you were referring to before, Father. It's those who are going to uh, secular um, institutions of higher learning, um, 
even sometimes even Roman Catholic seminaries, very common, Romanians, Greeks. Oh, you go to, you went to seminary in Rome at the Oriental Institute. That makes you like a, a rock star. But so obviously that slowly molds people over time to lose the Orthodox persuasion. Uh, not everyone. And there's, uh, and there's, uh, you know, people that could do good with educations like that. But we're just talking generally people can't swim against the current. They get taken by the current. Well, it's not an so, accident that this has been cultivated from the 1920s. Along with the calendar change, there was a stated goal of Miletus Metexakis was that they would exchange people on the seminaries. And they've been doing it since the 60s for sure. If the president patriarch was trained in Rome. He's got his Ph.D. in canon, canon law. Uh, and his uh, Ph.D. called for a, a whole, a, a whole uh, overhaul of the canons uh, to determine what's applicable today. So if, if I am, if I am correct in that, I'm not sure that I don't know the details of what he said, but that's my understanding. Uh, here's a question. Uh, did you say you were writing a book about this? Yes, there's a, a book we just saw revealed today. It will be published God willing in the fall by uncut mountain press, uh, the rise and fall of the papacy. And what it does, it follows every century of the papacy. Uh, it speaks of what the um, Jewish and then early Christian apostolic ecclesiology was and builds up from there. And it follows all of the relevant developments and de debates. And so it's going to address these questions because you really can't answer the question of what happened to the papacy without understanding at its you know ep epistemic ecclesiastical um, tenets of the faith. And so uh, I cover this from historical perspective. And there is a, uh, there's a lot of research from the primary sources not yet published that will be in this. It's a real um, honor. In fact, going back and forth on this question, I was uh, asking Father Peter, is it okay this work is very academic? Does your press want to publish a work that's academic? And uh, Uncut Mountain Press is uh, dedicated to providing all different sorts of works. Uh, there's translations and apologetic works. Well, I think it fits perfectly. We've got St. Gregory Palamas on the procession of the Holy Spirit. We've got St. Gre Saint Hilarion uh, Trotsky on the dogma of the church. Uh, we just put, we're putting out this book here. Uh, let's see, do I have an image? Let me, let me, oh. Yeah, this book is coming out uh, very uh, within about two weeks. So, um, you know, we're getting close to, let me take that off the screen, uh, getting close to that uh, coming out. We also have uh, a book called The Errors of the Latins coming out in the next uh, six months or so. We have another book um, on the Orthodox Patristic Witness on Catholicism, a very extensive 800 page uh, collection of lives of the saints and the writings of the saints on Catholicism. And we also have a reprint of the papacy by Abbe Gute, who is, which is going to come out. So we, we, uh, or, or Uncommon Press is going to be the go-to publisher in English language for everything having to do with uh, Orthodox understanding of Catholicism in the near future. So that's an, that's a sneak preview of what you can expect from Uncommon Press. Let's see if we got any more, uh, one or two last questions. We've got to be out uh, in eight minutes. Uh, that's our uh, commitment. So let's see if we have anything else. Um, I don't see it. I can't help but feel we forgot a book. <laughs> I think there was another book on the list, Father. We talked about it briefly, and I, I can't. A book can't that we're publishing? It. That you're publishing, yes, or I've already published. It was relevant to what we we're discussing. I can't remember what it was. Well, my thesis, my doctoral thesis, is about the ecclesiological renovation of Vatican II. Um, I don't know, maybe John or or, or Justin, <laughs> if they're listening, they can remind us. We've got a lot, a lot of books coming out, so I don't even remember have uh, all of them. Uh, let me see if we got any questions here over in Crowdcast. We have. Uh, a bunch of folks over in Crowdcast following it. We did that. I think this is also seen as Orthodox Rome is probably not a reality any longer. Shouldn't uh, we focus on mission work 
among the papal Protestants and uh, and the whole need to initiate them through catechism and baptism. That was one of the questions we had. I mean, yes. I mean, quite frankly, uh, whether it's my book, a lot of my apologetics, uh, it is very much focused on the Roman Catholics, um, probably simply because I just find the development of the papacy uh, the most interesting of a lot of things, not that I don't cover other topics, but of course we have to evangelize Roman Catholics because they're not in the church and uh, salvation is normatively in the church. And so we want people uh, to have faith in Christ and to be working out their faith in fear and trembling with repentance. That means they got to repent of their schism. They need to be in the church. So here is the list of publications from Uncommon Press. What are we missing? Well, one of them is Catholicism by Elder Giorgio Gregorio. There you go. That's a pretty important text right there. A little small text, but important. Just goes over the basic divisions and problems. He doesn't cover everything. Uh, of course, we just released St. Jacobus of Evia, but I think with regard to our topic, the other big one in our uh, lineup of publications is going to be The Church and the Pope. Is that what you're thinking of by Robert Spencer? The case for Orthodoxy? No. It, yeah, that's all about the first, first millennium. And then my my PhD thesis, the ecclesiological renovation of Vatican II, which is dealing with Vatican II ecclesiology. So yeah, if you're interested in uh, this topic, you're gonna you're gonna be uh, wanting to go over to Uncle Mountain Press. I think that wraps it up. I don't see any other questions. This has been a, a almost a three-hour session. It's been very informative. We're extremely grateful for your preparation, your time tonight, and uh, hopefully uh, it'll it'll get a, a wide uh, review. I would love to hear back from the folks on the other side that uh, you know, like Mr. Ibarra or Mr. Lofton or anybody else, uh, Mr. Uh, Trent, and um, we'll see what they have to say. But uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you, Father. And it's uh, it's an important topic. I appreciate that we got to talk about this because it's something we need to talk about. People need to recognize um, the spirit behind the union and the epistemology behind it. And so that way we could make a real union, a real union that will last, a real union where we could be on the same page and uh, worship uh according to the orthodox mode of worship. And that's what the prayer is all about. They often quote the prayer in ecumenism, the, the, the high priestly prayer, where that they all might be one, but proper interpretation of that is often not given. And that is that they all be one in going from the image to the likeness. In other words, in theosis, which means, of course, the church is a given. It's assumed. It's not. It, it would be absurd to interpret that as a union in Christ between her heterodoxy and orthodoxy. But unfortunately, that's how people twist the, that line of our Lord. Of course, the Lord wants us all together. Of course, He wants us all unified. That is what goes on. But the how that goes about, and we heard about this tonight. The the methodology. We heard about the 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 way being distorted. And they're not being, I mean, it doesn't surprise us. There's no repentance today From on many levels. There's not a lot of repentance in the world. That's why we're heading toward a third world war. That's why we're heading toward uh, the rise of transhumanism, because the Christians are not in the process and in the business of repenting for so many things. And so if, if repentance is off the table because, hey, we're both the church and who's going to, no one's going to say I'm not the church, right? So we've got to just get past that with a postmodern, reinterpretation of everything um that's just a you know of course it's going to be a total disaster it'll be a, a third false union leon florence and then we're going to have 2025 and this you know i don't know at nicaea it's it's not going to work and so it, it, you know everybody who's serious about loving their neighbor and about sharing the faith and about orthodoxy uh and and and, sh and bringing roman catholics and orthodoxy together in the one faith and one church they're going to be against this postmodern fabrication that they're that they're pushing. All right. right. Thank you so much. God bless. We'll Thank see you, you uh, all of you on uh, uh, Crowdcast and Patreon and Orthodox Ethos tomorrow night for our regular question and answer session. We're going to be moving back our question and answer session for uh, the, the new book we published, uh, Saint Jacobus. That's going to be next Friday because people still have not received the book. Unfortunately, we have delays in fulfillment. Uh, but next Friday on the 14th, we'll be moving that. 
And then on Tuesday, we'll be back again uh, on Orthodox Ethos. So we look forward to it. God bless everybody. Good night. And we'll see you soon.